Let's uh, call this uh, meeting of the Utilities Advisory Commission to order. We'll do roll call. Commissioner Danher, we'll start with you on that end. Here. Uh, Foster here. Hall here. Schwartz here. Uh, so four present, we are expecting others. Uh, we are now gonna move to oral communications. I have three cards, we'll call people as I have them. If anyone else wants to speak to any issue, they are welcome to. First up is Jesse Cruz to be followed by Lynn Krug. Oh, I'm sorry, what? You, would you like to go in a different order, did you say? Oh, I'm sorry, I understand, okay. Uh, in that case, Raymond Herrera to be followed by Jesse Cruz. Got it right? Come on up. So just come on up right there. And uh, you got the next three minutes are all yours. By the way, I will tell you just, just so you know, the way the rules work is we're supposed to listen to your input. We can ask you a question if we're not clear. We're not supposed to provide feedback to you. That's the way the rules work. So with that, we'll be yes. interested in your comments. Yes. Good evening. My name is Jesse Cruz, utility system operator, journeyman for 30 plus years, 12 years with PG&E and 21 years for the city of Palo Alto. The work that I do controls the city's electric operations 24 seven. I am one of the two operators. Normally it is being run by five employees. We have lost four of our journeyman operators due to, I believe, inadequate compensation provided by the city of Palo Alto. I believe that the inability of the city utilities department to provide com competitive compensation is the main reason we cannot find qualified individuals to do our duties as utility system operator at the utility control center. And here with me is Raymond Herrera, one of the other journeymen as utility system operator. Good evening, Utility uh, Advisory Commission. I'm Raymond Herrera, journeyman uh, system operator. Um, brief to touch on what we actually do. On uh, April 9th at uh, 6.55 a.m., um, the power to City Hall was cut, was uh, turned off, and also one-fourth of the power downtown. Um, I'm the one who did it. I opened up the breaker. I, I had to. There was wire down, um, which came loose, close to the train tracks, which is lined in the parking lot across some cars. One of our city employees saw it phoned it in, you know, and using the skills and equipment we had, we were able to pinpoint exactly where he was and safely de-energize that. Unfortunately, if that would have happened between 4 p.m. and 6 a.m., um, with only two of us being on call, we would have uh, uh, the customer who's looking to get, maybe to talk to someone who knows about electricity, to call that in would have been met by an operator who would then take the notes down, call one of us, and depending on where we live, have an hour to come in. That wire would have been live in the street for about an hour during rush hour, something, even if it's in the middle of the night, for public safety, that's kind of not good. So we're good, job, we're good at what we do, but you know, with just two of us, we can't do it all the time. Um, quickly, sorry about that, I'm trying to calm here. In my professional opinion, I mean, the inadequacy to provide a safe, safety for the employees and the residents, it's <coughs> come time towards time to have a serious discussion about it and really start to make a change. I mean, we give everything we have, you know, to operations to make sure everyone's safe. The power continues and keeps going, but, you know, we can't just, we can't do it by ourselves. I've seen people come in from SoCal who, I even tried recruiting friends, but to compensate for the cost of living when they come up here, they can't do it. So. so uh, Mr. Herrera, how, how long have you worked for the city of Palo Alto? Um, one year and four months, I came from sdg and &E, right, I was with them for about, uh, Twelve years. Great. Uh, well, thank you to both of you for your input, and uh, Mr. Herrera, we're, we're glad to have you on board the team, and Mr. Cruz, thanks for your many years of service to Palo Alto, and your input is very helpful. Thanks. Uh, next up is Lynn Krug.
Good evening, members of the Utility Advisory Commission. My name is Lynn Krug, and I'm Chapter Chair at SEIU for the City of Palo Alto. I'm an employee of the City of Palo Alto since the year 2000. Jesse and Raymond's concerns are very serious, and we're here to urge you to take an interest and look at the functions we perform as a utility and not leave it to a natural disaster or accident to make a decision. Hiring inadequately skilled employees or potentially compromising the safety of employees and residents is not a path we wish to follow. Relying on other cities in a disaster is not the answer for the day-to-day -day operations. Contracting out for different utilities such as USA Location and Water Gas Wastewater Inspection Staff has not produced good results. We wish to have a real dialogue with each of you, and I've left my card there so you can meet with us as a group and we'd be happy to meet with you. If you look to your left, there's a card sitting there. It says Lynn Krug. We wish to have a real dialogue with each of you regarding utility needs, hiring, compensation, training, and safety. We're proud workers for the city of Palo Alto. We work hard, and we take very much the residents' concerns and for our fellow employees, and hope that you will sit down and speak with us. Thank you. Ms. Krug, thank you very much for your input as well. Uh, we have one more speaker card. Uh, it is Herb Borak. Chair Forster and Commission, uh, the previous speakers reminded me that uh, uh, yesterday uh, the city posted a notice for a new job. It's a part-time job uh, in uh, what used to be called human resources. Uh, it's a non-benefited job at $50 an hour to be focused solely on recruiting people for the utilities department. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no further public comment. We will now move on to approval of the minutes. Anyone have any comments or proposed edits? Commissioner Hall, you're usually quite uh, helpful. In um, so I have no edits, but I have to abstain because I was not at the meeting. There you go. Uh, if there are no comments, I, um, I think we should approve, so I, I move that we approve. All second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? None carries unanimously with, with Commissioner Hall abstaining because he was absent. Uh, next up, agenda review and revisions. Director Fong, anything uh, to move around? I don't think so. Um, I, I did uh, want to note, I did want to note that um, you might have a photo op. Um, uh, following our uh, first item, which is the presentation on the Treeline USA Award. So if you could just be prepared to hop up and take a group picture, that would be fantastic. Um, oh, I, I, yeah, we were wondering if it would be um, okay with all of you if we moved item seven before item six. And either way, I think Commissioner Hall would m miss those both. So uh, that way we can get Carla out of here a little earlier. Hearing, hearing no objection, let's do it. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, reports from commissioner meetings and events. Um, commissioner Schwartz, I know you were just at a recent event. Anything you, uh, interesting you want to share with us? Not, not required, but if anything, you certainly can. A key nugget of wisdom. Oh, wait, wait, and hold on. Um, is your microphone on? You have to, yep, now you're on. Okay, right now, now I'm on. Ah. Okay. So I was at the uh, National Town Meeting in Washington, D.C., um, which is a, a national conference that looks at uh, smart grid. And the focus uh, this year was really on distributed energy resources and what does it mean to integrate those. And so I think there were a lot of things that were very relevant there. And then I also was at, on Monday, a uh, Siemens uh, um, executive roundtable where they invited um, sort of a range of utilities and um, ISOs uh, from U.S. and Canada and also uh, where there were several municipal utilities and um, several economists and former regulators like John Wellinghoff uh, of FERC. And uh, there were some very relevant things there in terms of um, that I think there's an, there may be an opportunity to share resources 
that there's a technical capability to share resources uh, in terms of meter data management systems and things like that, that um, we could take advantage of, as well as use the same platform for water, electricity, and gas measurements. So, you know, I need some guidance from the council, you know, from of when is the appropriate time to speak about it or to talk with staff or what the right thing is. But I thought there was a lot at both conferences that could be really valuable for Palo Alto. Great, thanks very much. <clears throat> uh, anything else? Okay, then we will move on to uh, Director of Utilities Report. Thank you very much. I have a few items on the Community Solar Program. We have terminated negotiations with the vendor Clean Energy Collective, um, known as CEC, but not to be confused with the California Energy Commission, for turnkey Community Solar Program. Now, this decision comes after a thorough risk assessment of program requirements and unsuccessful negotiations with the vendor um, for contract provisions to ensure transparency, protect consumers, and mitigate risks. As a result, we can't recommend moving forward with uh, the particular model that we were pursuing. In general, we felt that the program was too complex and the turnkey nature presented unique challenges for transparency and risk mitigation for our customers. You recall when we brought this around the last time, you all suggested that we look very hard at, um, and we were already in the process of doing it, but you, you basically validated the need to really make sure we had um, certain consumer protections uh, embedded uh, in our program. We will evaluate other community solar program structures with the objective to offer solutions for residents that are, who are unable to install solar at their homes. We may recommend changes to the local solar plan as a result of these negotiations, as well as um, uh, we may recommend changes. I don't understand my next phrase, so forget it. Um, and we'll try to identify the need for a successor program to net energy metering. I th think you all directed us to come back with something on that when it reaches its cap. We will provide an informational report with more details on community solar at your next meeting. Um, we anticipate returning to the UAC with a full update on the local solar plan by the end of 2015. Then we have another program, and hopefully you have heard about it, but if you haven't, here's a wonderful opportunity for you. Um, the Peninsula Sun Shares Solar Group Buy Program, and this is another piece of our local solar strategy, which is the, that Group Buy Program. We're participating with 12 other Bay Area communities to offer residents a solar group buy program. Um, Peninsula Sun Shares pools the buying power participants, allowing the solar industry to offer more competitive pricing for solar installations. The en enrollment deadline um, has been extended to the end of July, and so far Palo Alto is leading the region in number of enrollments with more than 46% of the total participation in this program. Through this program, we are making it easier and more affordable than ever for our residents to go solar. Then on another front, we have issued a renewable energy RFP. We um, want, uh, we have asked for delivery of energy in 2021 when one of our older wind energy contracts will be expiring. The response to the RFP was very good. Um, more than 40 proposals were submitted. Market prices for renewable energy still appear to be quite low. We're reviewing the proposals and we anticipate returning to you all with a negotiated um, contract for review in the fall. Then I have a series of events I'd just like to mention. Um, let's see, we've been, um, we sponsored a table at the emergency planning fair um, at Palo Alto Medical Foundation, um, Red Cross Abilities United and Office of Emergency Services. We held our first ambassador training for the Linkages Time Bank program. I think I brought that to you a little while ago. We've partnered with Bosca and Canopy on a free tree care in drought class. We participated in our Palo Alto 2030 Comprehensive Plan Summit to answer questions about the urban water management plan, about the drought, and about conservation, measure, uh, conservation resources. Then in June next, or this month, we're um, on June 3rd, which is tonight, uh, we're hosting a workshop which is called Design It Yourself Native Garden. We're speaking to the Department of Water Resources Independent Technical Panel on Palo Alto's adoption of the Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance um, next week. We're offering an Install It Yourself Native Garden Workshop on Saturday, June 13th. And all of this is on our website, but um, I'll read through it because these are um, 
certainly a big effort on the part of staff. We're tabling at the Palo Alto Family YMCA on Saturday, June 20th to provide members with resources for water conservation. We're hosting a, zero, a net zero home energy efficiency workshop on Saturday, June 27th. You know, again, all of this is on our website, but we just wanted to flag that we are doing um, um, a lot of this effort. Uh, thank you, Director Fong. I'm going to elaborate on the uh, one point, which is the uh, solar shares program. I was happy to hear that our participation rate is so high, so um, I asked uh, Ms. Elver to provide some additional information, and I'll convey it to you here because I think it's so remarkable. Um, of the communities, I'll mention a few com communities sort of at random in how many participants they've had. Uh, Atherton, one. Uh, Los Altos, one. Menlo Park, six. Now I'll get to the big ones, the ones that had a lot. Foster City, 28. Uh, let's see, we've got another one here. Burlingame, 38. And then outside of Palo Alto, the big winner, the big winner is Redwood City at 55. And then there's Palo Alto with 175. I mean, you know, blowing everybody else away. Um, and so just showing Palo Alto's interest in renewable energy. They and also to show the department's done a good job. And, uh, some, program. Someone's doing something right. Um, thank you, Commissioner Denner. Um, don't do it right. These are people who want to have solar on the rooftop. Is that the? Is that's that right. You're... It's a um, director firing. It's a group buy program put together by who? By Vote Solar. Or Vote Solar. So the idea was a group buy program to bring down the cost for anyone participating. Um, and so I don't know if we just promoted it better than everyone else, or we. I mean, obviously Palo Alto, in terms of population, is significantly smaller than Redwood City. Uh, and yet we have, what did I say, three times as many participants. Did you say there's one more month left in this? Or? Through the end of July, and end I do July. think it's brilliant communication and marketing. I'm sure it is. Um, on that particular point, have we, um, I get my periodic messages from the mayor. I would love to see a message from the mayor highlighting this point and telling people they only have another, whatever, 55 days or whatever it is. So that's my... Well, we will certainly mention it to the communications PIO. Sounds um, good. Okay. Anything, any questions or whoops? Uh, yeah, I had a question about the, uh, the successful RFP, at least in terms of responses. I was wondering if it was, uh, I, I presume it was a predominant solar response. I was wondering if there was a smattering of other types of resources than solar. Yes, I believe that there was a smattering, and again, when we come back to you, we'll show you a scattergram uh, of what uh, reflects the prices and the types of technologies. Okay, uh, Director Pong, thanks very much. I'm assuming there is no unfinished business to address, and if so, let's move on to the presentation on the city's receipt of the Treeline USA Award. Hi, I'm Courtney Shum. I'm, with, I'm an employee with the City of Palo Alto. I'm in the uh, tree department. I'm an arborist, a certified arborist in Oregon, or urban forestry department. But I manage the power line clearing contract, which the utilities department funds entirely. I'm sorry, I should have backed up and thanked you for giving me the opportunity to, to um, come into the meeting tonight. Um, so like I said, the, I manage the power line clearing contract, and it's very important since Trees are probably the number one cause of outages throughout um, most utilities, being a living, breathing resource, and they're very unpredictable. It's a, a resource that needs to be managed to ensure safe and reliable power throughout the city. The current power line clearing contract consists of clearing all vegetation from uh, high voltage lines, transmission lines, secondary lines, fiber optics, poles, substations, uh, pad mount uh, transformers, and um, I'm trying to think, oh, street lights and uh, traffic signals, sorry. So we prune currently about 7,000 trees per year just in the city of Palo Alto. So these are street trees and trees along easements and other areas. And as you can imagine, it's typically not the most popular program in the city as residents are very emotional about the state and the condition of their trees, privacy is a, a very uh, concerning issue 
with the residents. So we are trying to manage the objectives of keeping the power on, keeping our, our distances clear of uh, what the city, I'm sorry, the um, California Public Utilities Commission mandates we do, and then also keeping our constituents happy. So I wanted to come in tonight and formally tell you and present an award that we received from the National Arbor Day Foundation, where we're recognized as now as a tree line USA. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the tree city USA status that several cities have. So in order to become a tree city USA, which Palo Alto has been now for 28 years, we have to fill out an application <coughs> annually and then show that we provide excellence in tree care by meeting certain criteria. So um, that program's been around for a long time. The National Arbor Day Foundation in Nebraska decided to move the Tree City USA um, award program into other realms such as campuses. So now Stanford, with the help of our urban forester, is now Tree Campus USA. And they also have to provide certain programming and awareness of their, of their students and the interactions with trees and tree planting. And now they have this Tree Line USA. So um, I just think this is a, something that he mentioned last year, he said we should apply for this award because we currently not only meet, but I think we exceed a lot of the criteria. So the criteria for this award were we had to show excellence in quality tree care, which we absolutely do. I mean, we have um, a lot of contract language that requires our contractors to prune trees in a manner that's um, consistent with ANSI standards for tree pruning around electrical conductors. Um, using directional pruning methods, they have to take into consideration the species of tree, the diameter, the condition of the tree, the drought, other factors, so that we are not doing things that are detrimental to the tree, but we're also keeping trees clear of the power lines. Um, we have annual worker training. Both our contracted staff and our in-house staff are all trees, tree line, I'm sorry, line clearance certified. Several of them are also utility specialists. Um, these are all accreditations that are obtained through the uh, International Society of Arbor Culture. We have 10 certified arborists on staff. And our current line clearing contractor, Utility Tree Service, I don't know if you've seen them throughout the city, they typically have about five, um, five crews running at any one time. It's a pretty big operation. It's about a million dollars a year and stuff. So it's, uh, they're prolific, I think, through the city. At some point, you'll see them in your backyard or in your front yard pruning trees keeping them clear of the power lines. But their general foreman, he's not only a utility line clearance specialist, he's also a certified arborist. And they perform in conjunction with our in-house crew, aerial rescue. Um, they set up a little demonstration site within a park so that they can have their, they can continue with their accreditation program. And they go up and rescue a dummy in one of the redwood trees and bring it down. And it's all timed so that they know that if there's ever an issue where a worker might touch an energized conductor that they can get them down safely and efficiently. So we do a lot of annual worker training. We also had to show evidence that we uh, work with the community on tree planting and public education. And as I'm sure you're very well aware, we, we uh, partner with the nonprofit Canopy. And they're a big part of our Arbor Day celebration. We have the Utilities Committee, uh, I'm sorry, Commission is a partner with us and sponsors a booth for public education and we talk about right tree, right place, and why it's important to plant certain trees under power, power lines. And we also provide incentives, I'm sorry, the utilities department provides incentives to have homeowners call us and have us remove the tree and, and we give them uh, rebates for replanting the proper tree in the right spot. Because a healthy forest, or a healthy urban forest is part of a broader uh, sustainability climate action plan because our trees are green infrastructure unlike other uh, pieces of infrastructure throughout the city they actually increase in value over time so from the time a tree is planted it's only going to increase in value so the larger it gets the more gallons of storm water it intercepts so we know right now we have a calculation uh, module built into our software system we know based on the tree species based on the diameter based on the location how many, and based on, um, I'm sorry, I did say species, how many gallons of storm water that tree will intercept. We know how many kilowatts of energy <coughs> that tree will then um, provide based on its location and shading. We also know how many pounds of carbon that tree will sequester. So this is a big issue with, you know, as far as it's great to prune trees from the power lines, but it's also um, even better 
to prune them in a way that keeps them healthy and, and viable for the rest of their lives. So we also, I'm trying to think of the other criteria for this award, we had to produce some evidence that we have a tree-based energy conservation plan, and I threw in a lot of literature from the City of Palo Alto's utilities website about rebate programs that they provide to homeowners about energy efficient landscaping, and finally that um, they participate in this now very large Arbor Day celebration that happens every March over at Mitchell Park. We have over 500 people in attendance last year. PG&E also partnered with the city and brought out a um, demonstration board that the kids loved because they got to move trees around this little board to show you know, where energized conductors were and also adults <laughs> to see you know, why choosing this particular type of plant is a much better choice over others. So with that, I just wanted to so come on down and receive the reward on behalf of sure so <laughs> but should we do it with the whole gang Any reason uh, well to? maybe you could uh, come and receive the award first and then we'll get the photo op I see okay but you have to um, ignore the fact that the plaque has a misspelling in it so they were supposed to expedite, expedite the uh, Ms. Shem, a quick question. Uh, yeah, sure, uh, the department's also looking at whether how, how fast to continue the undergrounding program of our power lines. Does trimming the trees for that do a lot of damage to the trees uh, as, well, as compared to those neighborhoods where the lines are undergrounded? A lot of people, that's mainly the, the main question I get when I'm out with the crews, the, the residents are saying, when are these lines going to be brought underground? And I'm looking around on their property and I'm saying, you know, by the time when they excavate to accommodate the underground line, you're going to have a lot of root root area severed, which is also you know, certainly not good for the trees. So um, fortunately, unlike other cities in the area and other cities that are now copying us, we have this tree technical manual in place, which mandates and, and requires con um, contractors to strictly adhere to uh, root pruning and different boring techniques and stuff when working around tree roots. So we are always, you know, walk walking out and making sure that these contractors are adhering to these. Thank you. Do you want to um, just okay. get a little quick picture and then maybe, yeah. um, uh, do you guys m mind if you come on down in front of here and maybe we could. All right. Yeah, I, it might be easier if, do you mind if you come on down and. I'd suggest that members of the uh, Palo Alto residents here and members of the utility yeah. department join us for the photo op. Yeah, it's your award for having all the infrastructure in place. So this is the first year of many years, hopefully, in the career. I would say about the extra letter T in the first word. Hi, I just wanted to ask you one question. Um, wow. Sorry, what was her name? What's her name? Oh. Courtney. Courtney, I wanted to just ask you one question. Um, so one of the things that um, has come in, in a lot of the customer engagement literature, it talks about when people can see their collective impact on the environment and what the carbon reduction is, mm -hmm. that that makes them much more inspired to do more because it's much more meaningful when it's a group and that gets Absolutely. them to take action. So do you do anything to show sort of what the group impact is of everything that's happening within Palo Alto with the trees and what the contribution is? We do, we do. I don't know if this is, this is still on, okay, good. Um, I don't know if you saw there was that we had a large check that represented the it was a representation of the value of our current urban forest, which were just the inventory trees, just the street trees. Um, and I think it's around $6 million as far as their ecosystem benefits, since we are able to calculate that now through a, a, a module called a iTree, which was created by the United States Forest Service, Department of Forestry. 
Um, and we have, as soon as we can link it to our website, something, um, we use a software program called My Tree Keeper, but we're working with Canopy on this preferred restricted species list. Again, to show people that if you make a decision to plant this type of tree, these are the benefits you're gonna get over time. And if you design it where you plant it on your property uh, on, in this aspect, or you make this choice, these are the benefits you're gonna receive versus something smaller, ornamental, you know, where you just happen to find what was on sale and things like that. So we do have, we're, we're excited about the future of, of what we're gonna to present to the public because we definitely have a lot of people very interested now in you know, reducing carbon footprint and all those buzzwords and, and, and greening and energy costs and certainly with the drought, making better choices with native species. Thank you. Okay, th th thanks again. Okay, that takes us on to election of officers. Now let me, I'm gonna just talk about this for just a moment more for our new members, um, for our old folks, we've been doing this for a while. So once a year, we have to elect a chair and a vice chair. Um, and we tend to do it around this time. Uh, Commissioner Waldfogel was our last vice chair, so we've been operating without a vice chair. We've kind of managed to muddle through. Um, and so we, uh, but technically, uh, according to the bylaws, and I'll thank uh, Jeff Hoyle for reminding us of this, our bylaws actually say our officers serve from July 1st to June 30th. Uh, and so in prior years, we have sometimes had this election in July, but we're doing it ahead of time. So Director Fine, I'm gonna take the position that what we are doing here is we are electing a vice chair to serve for the remainder of this month, and we are electing a chair and vice chair to serve from July 1 to June 30. I don't think we actually need to wait until July. There's nothing in the bylaws that say we have to wait until July. So we're just gonna take care of business. Uh, Commissioner Eglash, uh, who was not here tonight, has indicated in the past that he is not interested in serving as chair or vice chair, just from a time commitment. Um, I will tell you, Commissioner Dan Heron Schwartz, the time commitment is not extraordinary, but you do get the benefit of showing up at city council meetings from time to time. As I did, by the way, you know, I should have mentioned my uh, enjoyable evening uh, with uh, uh, city council member Phil Seth Scharf and the rest of the team for three hours the other night talking about Palo Alto Clean. It was very interesting. But in any event, so, uh, so Steve does not want to be chair or vice chair. Uh, uh, Garth uh, has his water conflict, so he's taken himself out of the running for the most part. Um, uh, Commissioner Cook and I have basically, with the exception of one year of Commissioner Waldfogel recently, Commissioner Cook and I have tended to do this for quite some time. Uh, Commissioner Schwartz and Dan, we're certainly looking forward to your participation in these roles in the future. But in any event, for the moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to nominate uh, Commissioner Cook to be vice chair for the remainder of this month, as well as for all of next year. And so that is my motion. And I guess we need a second on that one. I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, and then we, any discussion? If not, all in favor? In favor. Aye. Aye. Aye, all opposed? Nay, very good, we've taken care of that one. And so I would be happy to uh, nominate uh, Commissioner Foster to continue on in his excellent job as chair. <laughs> Thank you kindly. I second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Good. And in that case, we have just taken care of a 10 minute item in three minutes. Director Fong, you should be pleased by our work on that. Okay, next up is um, discussion on approach to uh, the following items for commissioner consideration as suggested by council. And let me take just a moment here to talk about this a little bit. We talked about it last time. Uh, but when the UAC met with the city council in April, uh, the feedback we received from the individual uh, city council members in this meeting was quite clear on a number of points they would like the Utilities Advisory Commission to address. And there were five in particular. Uh, one is fiber to the premises, one is electric undergrounding, a third one is fuel switching slash electrification, a fourth is water recycling, and the last item was second transmission interconnection with the city's electric grid. Now these are all issues the UAC has spent time on in the past, and some of them are on our agenda for later, in this, later this year anyway. Um, but what I would like to ensure we do, and I, I think there's consensus around the table, is make sure that we are able to provide feedback uh, to the City Council on these five issues uh, by the end of this year, 
Uh, and in order to do that, we have agreed at our last meeting to uh, assign different UAC members to different topics in a ad hoc subcommittee type approach. Um, I have wrote, uh, reached out to the city council's office and they are fine with this approach. We certainly cannot have more than three members on any subcommittee. We'd run into Brown Act issues and other sorts of issues if we did that, and so we are not going to. Uh, the way it is uh, headed is uh, Commissioner Hall and Commissioner Cook have agreed to work together on the electric undergrounding issue and the second transmission interconnection issue. Uh, Commissioner uh, Schwartz and Commissioner Danaher have agreed to work on the fiber to the premises issue. Commissioner Van Dusen has agreed to work on the water recycling issue and she would like a partner for that. Commissioner, Commissioner Schwartz, you ready to do double duty? Very good, we just found a partner, a partner for uh, Commissioner Van Dusen. Um, I have held off assigning myself to any of them because I am prepared to help out everybody and so long as we keep our numbers at two on any of these commi commissions or uh, committees, I should say, we can do that. Commissioner Eglash again has indicated he is very, very busy and so for the right now he'd prefer to hold off and so I think that's where we are. With respect, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the fiber one because that's a big one and one that we have not dealt with really at the UAC over the last couple of years um, because other city commissions have been set up and so on and so forth, and so the UAC sort of stepped back from that one. Um, I would, Director Fong, uh, I've encouraged uh, Commissioner Schwartz and Commissioner Danaher to speak to the city's chief information officer, uh, as well as to Jim Fleming. Um, and Val, I was gonna send you an email on that point, uh, and Jim, I see you sitting in the back uh, on that point. Uh, we can discuss how that occurs and who should participate. Um, but it will help Commissioner Schwartz and Commissioner Danaher get up to speed. Um, they are also going to speak to Bob Harrington, who uh, is certainly knowledgeable on all things fiber. And then one other point, although we have focused in our conversation on fiber to the premises, the concept of citywide Wi-Fi has been added. Um, and, and so we really should be looking at both of those, because as I understand, citywide Wi-Fi is is potentially an alternative. Um, and so we, you know, since the, the city council, since city staff is talking about that, city council will consider it, we should as well. So, yes? I actually just wanted to correct that, that's all right. So I don't think we at the city council view it as an alternative. Okay. We view it as complementary. Oh, wait, are you, can you hear? Sorry, I said we at the city council view it as complementary, not as an alternative. Okay. And that you should look at them both together and, you know, Separately, it's not, it's not we do one or the other. Okay, I'm just gonna say that back to make sure everyone heard. So uh, Council Member Scharf is saying the City Council does not view it as one or the other or as Wi-Fi as an alternative, um, and we should look at them in that way. And that sounds good to me. Uh, okay, uh, anything, believe it or not, that's a, so the key is really gonna be up to each of these subcommittees to push the ball forward and I'm gonna help, I'm happy to help anyone anytime, but you're mostly gonna, you know, it's gonna be up to you to do what you want. Um, and it would be great to get a, a brief report from each subcommittee on progress. Here's what we've done, here's what we're gonna do, and so on and so forth. Director Fong. Oh, I'm sorry, I just wasn't quick enough with my note taking. I have Holland Cook on electric undergrounding and second transmission. I have Schwartz and Danaher on fiber. I have Van Dusen and Schwartz on water recycling and I didn't catch who was doing electrification. Uh, there was a reason you didn't catch that because we don't have anyone yet on that. Um, and I, I will be honest that I was hoping Commissioner Eglash would take that one on, but he is hesitant to do so just because of the time commitment. Uh, part of me is thinking that, um, Director Fong, I, if, you, if I remember correctly on our rolling calendar, that issue is coming our way for the full UAC. Yeah, you can make that um, appointment later. So I, so I think we may be able to get away with that one. Commissioner Schwartz? Uh, is there somebody on on your staff uh, on your staff who would want to be part of what we're doing, or would you rather we go do our work and then come back and later on talk to your staff about what we're the kind of projects that we're looking at? So I would imagine that you would want to tag into what's already happening on the fiber or water recycling. So for you, it'll be an education process initially, and so there's yeah there's staff available to to work with. Now I think particularly on the fiber issues. Um, Vice, uh, Chair Foster has mentioned um, Jonathan Reichenthal, who's our CIO, and then Jim Fleming, who's um, in our audience here, and they are very key to everything going on in fiber. 
um, in the city, uh, very involved in the, the, the drivers. Um, on water recycling, it's um, driven largely right at this moment out of the Public Works Department, um, but we're also very involved. So I, I wouldn't um, recommend that you expend a lot of energy trying to create something. I would say just figure out what's currently going on and then figure out what else needs to be done. Um, I imagine part of your role is to work with the existing team and to the extent you have insights and input to share those, but also to report back to this body on what you're learning and um, any concerns that you might have or, in fact, things that you think are going well. I mean, that's the kind of thing I think your role would be. Um, Chair Foster will correct me if he sees it differently. I agree 100 percent. And I do think, to, to kind of follow up on that point, uh, Commissioner Schwartz, that reaching out to Jim Fleming, Jonathan Reichenthal, the appropriate folks on water recycling early on and just kind of, and, and of course, well, no, no, Jim Fleming on, and Jonathan Reichenthal on fiber, and then the appropriate folks on water recycling. Um, or, you know, well, of course, Director Fong gave us that packet of whatever we want to call it material. So starting there, reading all that, then getting kind of latest and greatest information from Jim and others, and then, of course, reaching out to other people, you, you know, the Bob Harringtons of the world on fiber and other folks. And then my guess is you may circle back from time to time to members of city staff, or to Director Fong, and of course we'll all in our monthly meetings discuss what you've come up with and so on and so forth. All with this aim of hopefully by the end of the year being able to provide a recommendation to the city council and understanding of course, and this is important, of understanding on what path the, U the utilities department staff may be making a recommendation to us to make to the city council. So if it's an issue where they're not going to make any recommendation, it's not on their to-do list over the next six months, then we're kind of on our own. If they are making a recommendation, then we need to, you know, in October, then we need to kind of factor that in, in which case you guys become the ones who are the most prepared when that comes. That, that's council. why I'm asking if there's somebody who's already working on it that we should collaborate with. So what I would say, and, and uh, Council Member Sure, if you have the look of a man who's going to say something, so I'm going to ask you a question. But go ahead with what you're going to say first. Well, if I actually wanted to say, first of all, I'm available if either any of you need to liaise with me on terms of these committees. I'm happy to talk to you about it. Um, and then I wanted to say that I think all of these are actually really meaty issues, and they actually take a lot of work. So I think I'm going to give an example of of the um, undergrounding. I think for since I've been on council, frankly. I remember running in 2009 on the, people talk about how they want their utilities underground. Right? And right now, I mean, the situation is, is we're really not undergrounding any more utilities, except for a few small areas where we get a little bit of extra money. So the answer is, we're really never going to underground your utilities. So the real question is, should we underground people's utilities? I think that's the threshold question. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some real pros in doing it, and I think there's some cons that I've also heard. So I think that's the first thing. And if we did decide to move forward and do that, how would we finance it? Well, I think the only way we'd finance it, frankly, is to have a tax on, you know, on utilities, basically, on people's bills. That would, that would entail going to a vote of yeah. the public, mm -hmm. right? So the committee would need to basically understand how much money would we need to raise, what that, how much that tax would need to look like. We tend to need to, the city council can put something on the ballot, so we're not going to obviously make this coming ballot. So the sh if you want to put something on the ballot, it should be 2016, and that's what you should work towards. Um, typically, we need to put something on the ballot before we go on our uh, recess. So you'd have to work backwards from that. And obviously, not only would you have to talk to utilities um, staff, but I think it's you know talking to the finance staff and stuff about how much money do we need to raise? What would it cost to underground all this? What would be the sequencing? How would you do the neighborhoods? How are we going to, who are we going to start with? How are we going to maintain the whole concepts of equity in the neighborhoods? And I just think there's all those issues there. And I think you'd have to deal with every single one of them if we want to do this right and, and get it. So, and I think, you know, so on these could, other so issues. So could I just throw in, um, so he, uh, what uh, Council Member Sharp is describing is completely accurate. Um, there, there's um, the other way to look at, for instance, undergrounding is to take the threshold question and get that answered before you dive deep into everything else because sometimes it may not be, when, when we're talking $200 million, um, you, you might 
I want to know if that's, there's even an appetite in the community for that kind of expenditure on, on either property bills or, or in the electric rates. So just um, you know, be aware, some of, these, some of these dollar amounts are pretty large. Right, and Director Fong makes a good point, is that there may be other financing mechanisms besides the utility you know, rate, such as a property tax rate. And obviously the other point is you have to look at the 50% versus the two-thirds requirement. Mm -hmm. um, let, me, let me follow up on that. Uh, first of all, uh, Council Member Sheriff, thanks for your comments and significantly for your offer to be a, a sounding board and provider of input and so on and so forth. And I encourage everyone here to take Commissioner Sharf up on that. So for example, Commissioner Danaher and Schwartz, that you guys should definitely be reaching out to Greg and talking about what's, you know, FTTP. I mean, that FTTP one is a complex one. And there is this whole process right now that's going to lead, as I understand, to a recommendation even if we do nothing here later this year. So we're sort of kind of that, like the plane's heading down the runway or about to land or whatever it is. And so we need to get in there and decide how we're going to weigh in on it, when we're going to weigh in it, and so on and so forth. And I think kind of understanding from Council Member Scharf the, the history there. But you know, same for electric undergrounding and so on and so forth. Let me, on electric undergrounding in particular, I was struck by uh, comments that were made fr by the City Council when we met with them is they may not be looking for us to make a single recommendation, and different city council members may feel differently about this. In some cases, they may be looking to us simply to provide an analysis of the options. So in other words, not let's underground or let's not underground, but here are the pros and cons of undergrounding, and here's what's going to cost. And, and to, Commissioner, uh, to Council Member Scharf's point, here is a couple of different options on how we could pay for it. Uh, vote, you know, tax, vote, you know, vote, so on and so forth. Who knows what else there is? And so I think coming back, ultimately the city council will make the decision. And obviously you could, you know, so we could provide them with options. We could provide them with options and a recommendation um, and so on and so forth. So I think we have some flexibility on how to do that. Okay. Um, that's my comments, yeah. Commissioner Dinner. Uh, your question for uh, Val Fung. Did the master plan that's been commissioned, was that commissioned by the utility department or by another part of the city? Uh, can you tell me which map we oh, the, on, on fiber to the premise? There's there's a consultant coming back yes. with a plan. Um, a, that is being managed out of the IT department. However, Jim Fleming is extremely involved in uh, every okay. step of it, and he actually reports into utilities. All right, thank you. So I, I had a general question question note for, for uh, Chair Foster and any mm -hmm. other commissioners for ideas and, and Council Member Shaw too. So realizing that every one of these tasks or projects is going to have its own life, some short, some longer, I'm just wondering if there's a general time frame by which we are generally expected to either review whether we continue or, or c conclude all the work. Is there, is there any sense of a time frame on this? And I'm sorry, uh, uh, wait, to... Uh, on, all, um, on all of these tasks. On all co of these five collect tasks. Collectively, is the sense here we, sh we should be done, you know, pretty much wrapped up in a year, if not earlier? With, with our work on the UAC? With, with all of our work on these projects. Uh, I would say by the, I would love, I think our target is to be able to make a recommendation to the city council by the end of this calendar year. Now, we may eventually decide that's not possible on one or more issues, and if that's the case, that's the case. But I think that's the timeline we should shoot for. So I'd work backwards and say we'll have a meeting in the first week of December, and it would be great if we could make recommendations coming out of that meeting, a vote of our seven commissioners, that you know, a two-page, three-page kind of memo on each of our five topics, if we can. Now, remember, some of them, like fiber to the premises, ironically, Maybe we have to do faster because of the timeline of the city. And again, there may be others where for one reason or another, perhaps work that the staff is doing that isn't going to be done until next February where we just have to hold off. But that would be my gut, uh, target. That may be the situation with the interconnect. I think that was late in the year or early next year that would be ready. And Director Fung, I was actually going to ask you what the timeline is from your perspective on these topics. So let's, <clears throat> that's a good segue on that point. Um, Director Fong, of our five topics, which ones do you expect the so, city staff will bring anyway, regardless of our work to the UAC? Yeah. So definitely in August, we are um, bringing forward um, the CTC, fi or just the fiber to the premise master plan, the wireless network master plan. So you'll have a session in August. Uh, oh, Jim just changed it to September. He doesn't know I'm looking at a piece of paper that says August. 
<laughs> and then we're going to bring the recycled water uh, project to you in August. Um, so a couple of those, um, if you did nothing, you'd at least um, you, you know, have a chance to weigh in on, on where we are with those in August. Um, and uh, well, anyway, those are some of the t two quickies, for instance. Okay, so those two are coming soon. How about second electric connection? When is that coming next? Yeah, I don't have a time frame for that right now. So um, latter half of the year, would you expect? Um, well, it's underneath on the to be scheduled. So sure. Okay, and then uh, uh, electrification or, or fuel switching, whatever we want to call that. Uh, that's up for July. If you look uh, at the rolling calendar. Okay, July. But, yeah. So that's a, is that electrification phase one work plan response to colleagues memo? I don't uh, there's yeah two two items you'll see. Oh, so an update. One is an yes, analysis of yep. what it uh, what is involved with electrification. The other is the uh, phase one work plan. Uh, got it. Uh, okay, so I think we're good. We I think so too. Great. Okay, any other comments, questions? Great, thanks everyone. Uh, we will now move on to the next agenda item. Director Fong, I'll note that the current time is 7.55 p.m. or five minutes ahead of schedule. And we are moving on to staff recommendation that the Utilities Advisory Commission recommend that the City Council adopt a resolution approving design guidelines for the 2015 electric cost of service analysis. Um, as we get started here, I'm going to provide a little bit of background for our two new uh, commission members. Um, the, periodically, uh, we make recommendations to the city council on rate increases. Uh, unfortunately, they are generally rate increases because of how the way the world works, but it could be rate changes. Um, and we've had an experience in the past where we have perhaps not entirely agreed with how the rate increases. Remember, it's not simply a question of 2% increase, 4% increase, but also how that increase is implemented, fixed charge and, and this and that and the other thing. And we have sometimes um, not agreed with the way the increase is being implemented. And we have been told basically by the staff and the city attorney's office that tough, there's not much we can do about it. Um, apparently that advice is also provided to the city council. Uh, and it's because of the legal requirements under California law um, and, and Director Fong and others can provide more information. But basically, a cost of service analysis is required. And once that is done and it comes back and says what the cost of service is, the increase basically has to follow that. Um, and so once that is done, the results of it are kind of cast in stone. And so what we are doing now is spending more time looking at how the cost of service analysis will be done, because that's kind of going to be our last opportunity to provide feedback, then the work will go be done, it will come to us, but the reality is our response at that point will be kind of rubber stamp. So that's what we're here, and with that, Director Fong, take it away. Okay, now we're only a couple of minutes ahead, and if we don't take any potty breaks, we can stay on track here, but if you need, <laughs> you need a bio break, you just yell. So we have um, with us, actually, I should point out that um, John Aubenshine is doing two jobs right now. We have asked him to, um, for development of purposes to be the water gas wastewater collection, uh, water gas wastewater um, operations manager. He actually isn't even located in City Hall anymore. He starts his day at 6 a.m. pretty much, so he's, this is a long day for him um, because he's committed to seeing um, our um, customer service analysis and our rates issues um, through to the bitter end. Um, so we have uh, WGW operations manager, acting WGW operations manager, and um, our rates manager all in one right here. Congratulations on double duty. Thank you. Um, I'll try to stay fresh and lively here. Um, mm. <clears throat> so uh, I, I think uh, thank you, um, Commissioner Foster, for uh, giving that brief overview. I think I can uh, skip part of my presentation, so I think we're still in, uh, uh, I think we're still a little bit ahead of time here. Um, <clears throat> so I, uh, so tonight I'm gonna, um, uh, uh, we're, we're doing exactly what Commissioner Foster said. We're coming to you for um, some policy guidance 
um, before we get started with the electric cost of service study. And I know this is a this is a um, this is going to be a big topic, and there is a lot on people's minds in this area. Um, so why don't I launch into it and. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background. John, let me just interject for one sec. Um, uh, Mike, Judith, the presentation that is up there is on a paper copy at your place, but is also on the screen in front of you. If you flip it on, it's the button on the right, okay? Right. If you prefer not to twist your head around okay. and look at it up there. Well, now mine isn't. So, yeah, you, just in case you burp or something, you might not want that caught on tape. So I'll start by giving you a little bit of background on our uh, on our the history of our electric rates and um, some of the uh, the history of our electric rates. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an overview on what we see as the project goals um, for the electric cost of service study, and we hope that they largely reflect your goals as well. Um, <clears throat> and we've divided those into short-term and long-term issues. Um, we have some things that. Uh, that we can address, that we need to address um, on a pretty short timeline. We have some other things we think we can address on a short timeline, and then we have some other things that um, are going to take us a little bit longer to address because they involve some uh, much higher level policy issues that we're only, I think, starting to work on over the last year or so. Um, so what we've done is taken those short term items and put them into uh, the first part of a, work, a two phase work plan. And um, we're bringing you design guidelines tonight to deal with that uh, first phase of the work plan. I'll also give you an overview of our, you know, what we think tentatively we're looking at for the second phase of the project. Um, but uh, we don't have design guidelines for you on that tonight. We'll give you a bit of a timeline on when we think we're going to be back to you with that. So. Um, our current tiered, our current rate structure has been in place since the early 1980s. <clears throat> when uh, we, previous to that, we had a declining rate or a, a declining block rate structure. So uh, energy prices decreased as you use more energy. And in the early 1980s, uh, we, like a lot of other utilities, switched um, uh, away from that. Our residents are now on a three-tier residential structure. Um, the first 300 kilowatt hours as a, a, um, a particular rate, and then the uh, uh, next 300 kilowatt hours is at a higher rate, and anything beyond that is at a, an even higher rate. For commercial customers, we have a uniform rate uh, that varies seasonally. And for our larger commercial customers, um, we have a lot of their um, costs are collected through a demand meter charge based on their peak 15 minute demand. Uh, the last cost of service analysis we did was in 2007, and our last rate increase was in 2009. So our electric rates have been pretty um, steady for several years. After our last rate increase, about a year and a half after, uh, we pa uh, Proposition 26 was passed, which had the effect that uh, Commissioner Foster was describing. Um, we've been subject to Proposition 218 in our water rates and our um, wastewater rates and uh, refuse rates, storm drain rates for many, uh, for uh, probably two decades now. And <clears throat> um, in those utilities, we've always regarded the cost of service analysis as a very important way of uh, demonstrating, if we're ever challenged on our rates, that they are cost of service. <clears throat> um, Proposition 26, um, Created similar uh, created similar issues for um, uh, uh, for electric rates. Um, the uh, the F the um, so the FY 2016 electric utility uh, financial plan. Um, we're projecting that we're going to need to raise rates by six percent on July 1st, 2016, and we also have a whole variety of sustainability goals, uh, legislation, regulations, and technologies that are likely to have impacts on electric rates over the next few years. Um, the uh, the uh, this is a list of the short-term and long-term issues. Um, these are generally described in the report, um, so I won't go over each and every one of them in detail, just in the interest of time. Um, 
but I'm happy to answer questions on all of these as we go through. Um, our work plan to address the, uh, the short-term issues that I was... Is there any particular requirement for how often the cost of service study needs to be done? We like to do it every three to five years, so it's been a while. And for the last one electric. was eight years. Right? That's right. Um, so this shows the short-term, uh, our, our schedule for the short-term phase one work plan. Um, over the next few months, we're going to try and get your feedback on, um, on our design guidelines. We're also going to reach out to various stakeholders. Um, we have a variety of people in the community that, are, that have, have interest in these sorts of things. Um, and then we'd also like to hear from representatives from our customer groups as well. Um, at the same time, we'll be hiring a consultant to do the cost service study. By the time we have the um, design guidelines ready for adoption, we should have our consultant on board. And then in the fall, we'll get the cost of service study done. Um, and in, in uh, next spring, I think this, there's a typo up here. It should be spring 2016 and July 1st, 2016. We'll be doing our annual review and getting the rates adopted. Hmm. We actually, we all reviewed this. Sorry about that. <laughs> So um, this summarizes the design, guide, the design guidelines, and these are the issues that um, we think we need to address in the, um, in the first phase of the work plan. Um, so first and foremost, rates have to be based on cost of service. This is the overriding principle for the study. And um, if any of, the, any of our other policy guidelines can't be achieved within, um, you know, while still demonstrating the, the cost of service, um, this, has to over, this has to override. Um, <clears throat> the second guideline says that energy charges should be structured similar to the way they're currently structured. Um, you know, among the, the really wide variety of issues that we're um, looking at in the, um, in the long term here, um, uh, well, the reason for this is that um, we have, uh, they're, they're gonna, we're going to have a variety of capabilities for different sorts of rate structures um, coming on over the next few years if we uh, move forward with smart metering. Um, there are certain types of rate structures that we can't talk about right now, that we can't implement right now, like time of use, I mean, on a broad scale. Um, and so, and given the short time frame that we have for getting this cost of service done, um, we're looking at keeping to the, the current rate structure as closely as possible um, for, this, uh, for this study. So that's what this guideline is about. Um, guideline three, um, this is mainly about, there are a few rate schedules we need to look at, um, primarily our E18 rate, um, which is uh, for city operations, uh, as well as our E4 and our E7 rates. We want to see if any of these can be consolidated. Um, so that's what this, this guideline is about. Uh, number four is about considering the impact of rate designs on electric vehicles and electric heating customers. Um, one of the things we're starting to see is people uh, bring electric, uh, buy electric vehicles and um, look at electrify, electrify, moving away from gas um, is that they end up with very different load, load profiles from, uh, um, from customers who use gas heating and don't have EVs. In a, from a rates perspective, that, you know, that, that may very well justify some difference in how the rates are applied to those customers. So we'll take a look at that. The impact we're talking about is that the, uh, um, uh, these customers, while they may be using energy efficiently, still get bumped into higher rate tiers if they're residential. So are you looking at this at all in a way that says we're going to use this as a baseline so that if we're, as you're looking at the operational efficiencies possible by applying technology, that then you can get a benefit so that you, you may get an operational efficiency or you may, you know, in terms of to be able to tie into the goals of what you're trying to achieve with any new rate structure? Um, I. Uh I think what you're describing is a, along the lines of some of the things that we'll be looking at as part of that guideline. And, and because I'm also thinking that if you're doing a tiered system, I mean, one of the things that is possible if you have, 
you know, interval metering or something like that, that then you have the opportunity to let someone know that they're approaching the tier, you know, they're about to move into the new tier, so they have an opportunity to do something to try and mitigate that. Yeah, these are some of the things that we're experimenting with in the smart metering pilot, and then also, um, and this is how we're gaining experience with this sort of thing. Um, that'll feed into our rate design discussion in the long-term phase two part of the plan. So um, I think we're, we're definitely following up on those types of things. Um, and again, you know, this, this, what we do under guideline four may very well be a short-term, you know, it may very well be a, a short-term design. I mean, we're, we'll come back and we'll have a long-term design as we start to, you know, gather information from our pilot programs and from other studies as well. Um, for number five, uh, this guideline, um, we are one of the few utilities in California that doesn't have any sort of a fixed or minimum charge, and that includes PG&E and the other investor-owned utilities um, who have, are bringing a minimum charge online uh, in the next few years. Um, and this is about uh, equity. One of the things that um, we deal with is customers who have very, either very low bills or more commonly who have reduced their bills to zero using um, solar. And these customers still maintain a connection. We uh, stay online to provide backup service and there are uh, some customer, some service and billing related costs um, that really need to be recovered. Um, and a minimum charge may be the way that we need to do that. So we would like to get some buy-in from you that if we find that to be the way we want to go, um, that we can, we uh, will have your your buy-in if we come back with a rate design with a minimum charge. Uh, we also want to look at a hydroelectric rate adjustment mechanism. And we've talked about this in the past, and we've moved pretty far along in this analysis. This is a uh, we try to use reserves to balance out um, variations in costs related to our hydroelectric resources. Um, but sometimes those reserves aren't adequate. We'd like to see if we can reduce the, um, our reserve requirements. Um, and so we'll, uh, we're, um, we're looking at a rate adjustment mechanism that would be transparent to customers and would allow us to preserve our financial position even in an extended drought or to return some of the benefits of very high hydro generation to customers if our reserves are already replenished. Uh, just on that point, I just want to clarify, get a clarification, John. <laughs> so is that a situation where uh, without having to go to the city council to adopt right. a, a shift from one month to the next, you would simply have an automatic adjustment perhaps every quarter based on the hydro year? Uh, or once a year, but it okay. would be based on, it would be based on uh, some sort of a predetermined formula. Okay. Ideally, as simple as possible as we yep. could possibly make it. Um, <clears throat> we want to make sure we're considering the effect of rate designs on current and future solar customers. Um, we have some, you know, we, as part of our uh, the people who are working on our local solar plan, we can um, we're we're going to work with them to evaluate the impacts of any rate designs on the economics of solar, and um, if we need to uh, raise anything, um, we can do that. Um, the issue of the study of connection fees, this has a lot to do with um, the, uh, uh, this has a lot to do with um, the fact that as customers electrify homes or add EVs, um, they end up having larger service requirements. Um, and we want to make sure that our fees are dealing with that appropriately and these people are, are treated um, equitably. Um, and then we also want to make sure we don't forget about low-income customers. Uh, you can have, depending on what rate design approach you choose, you can have um, unforeseen effects on low-income customers. This is something that's coming up a lot with the investor-owned utilities who are shifting the time of use away from uh, tiered rates. So that's the summary of the design guidelines. Um, and then as far as the uh, what we plan to come back with in phase two. This is a summary of some of the things that we'll be looking at in 2015. Um, you can see there are a lot of high-level policy and long-term analyses that we're working on, and it, we're really just we're li we're a little bit too early um, in these analyses to really address rate design yet, which I think will kind of come out of our work in those other areas. Um, but my hope is that in 2016 we'll be able to come back and start having those rate design 
discussions um, for our long-term rate design plans. So that's what I have. I'm sorry, these are complex topics. I know we don't have that much time allocated to it. Um, so apologies if the... Uh, now, were you hoping for feedback at this meeting from the commission on, on these guidelines? Right, and so what yep. we're... I'm sorry, do we have to deal with the... Uh, it is an action item. Yes, what we're looking for is approval, is recommendation to the city council to approve these design guidelines, either as they are or with recommended amendments. Yeah, and just to clarify that point, so this is a recommendation the utility department staff is making to us. So they're saying we recommend, we, we as in they recommend to us, that we recommend to the city council this set of guidelines. We can do so or we can recommend something slightly different. If we recommend something, or very different, um, if we recommend something different, the city staff could adopt our recommendation and have a unified recommendation. That's often what happens if we don't agree. On the other hand, they could say, no, we'll stick with our recommendation, and then two different recommendations go to the city council, and they get to choose. <laughs> exactly, yes. There is finance committee as well along the way. A good point. Thanks. Um, and yeah, just to clarify uh, uh, how that works, our, our recommendation is to the city council, but it actually first, in general, goes to the finance committee that can then make its own recommendation. Right. So that's the deal. Right. So what we do now is we can ask all kinds of questions and, of course, discuss among ourselves. All right. Well, so, then I'll start. This yep. is very well done, very thoughtful, and I endorse your, your guidelines, including the, the minimum charge for the reasons you laid out. Um, I would be interested uh, sometime along the way, it's maybe not part of this COSA, but this starts from the premise that we have to stick within the COSA guidelines for any rate charges, and there's always, always the alternative of going to the voters to, approach, uh, to approve a different philosophy. I don't know what that would be or why we would do it, but I, I would love some discussion of that at some point of, in the long term, do we want to ask for voter approval of different uh, degrees of freedom on how we design rate plans? Yeah, just to follow up on that, I, I agree. I think that's an interesting point to to bring up. And the the case where I could see, um, the most obvious case I could see where that would happen might be where the restrictions based on the um, Constitution might be such that we feel like the cost service uh, leads to maybe a single tier. And maybe we decide that, or we recommend to the city council that the, the conservation efforts would be highly improved by having more than one tier, for example, or two versus three, whatever you want to do. But that's, that. when I was thinking about it, I was thinking that would be the most likely scenario where we might want to consider going to the voters. Where the, the voters might say, hey, look, it's important that we have, cons that we're not just considering a very narrow look at what the cost of service is, but we also consider um, we place a higher emphasis on conservation, and through that might lead to higher or more tiers. Thanks. So I did email last night a uh, question, and I'm going to come to it now, but I just want to precede that with a question. When we talk about uh, phase two, the, or the long term, uh, it seems to me that we're thinking about something that may be implemented within, by 2017. So we would implement a new rate structure and based on this idea for July 1, 2016, and then potentially a year later have another cost of service study completed so we could implement new rate structures in 2017. Is that the sort of time frame we're talking about here? I think that's the earliest. Um, I mean, if, if, if the stars were aligned and everything came together, we might be hitting 2017. But I, I think implementation is more likely a little further out. Yeah, particularly if it, it is driven mostly by the, a, a decision yet to be made on installing smart meters that would take not only a decision process, but then implementation phase over uh, maybe years. Absolutely. So um, in light of that, I'm going to be a little um, conservative in terms of what in my thinking about how long phase two would take. I would tend to think it's going to take longer than we've just described. And that the climate change opportunities and the sense we have on the city and the guidance from the city council is that we need to move when we can. I see no reason why in this study 
the part that you identified in part f step four couldn't be twisted a little bit more favorably towards action now. And that would simply be in, consider the opportunity for a, a, a carbon footprint benefit to be factored into your rate structure. And that I'm thinking about would affect two areas, maybe more, but one would be a subsidy for, for EV charging, and another might be additional benefits or higher rates for solar. I'm thinking about solar programs such as being already initiated by the city within the, within the city boundaries. So um, I think that it's not really rocket science. It would, it's certainly within the scope of Rotellos or some of these other companies that do these kind of studies to do that. Are they being asked by other clients to do that? I think that the idea of figuring out incrementally what vehicles would save in terms of greenhouse gases can be compared with the, as if Commissioner Eglesh was here, he would be very articulate in this point, that th there is a um, external to the city impact when we increase use of electric power. Incrementally, probably, some of that, or maybe substantially amount of it, would be generated by ca uh, carbon fuels. So the question then would be, with that assumption, and the city has really good data on that, uh, could you derive whether there is a significant benefit to the climate, but potentially by having a, or having a structure that in, in sense that, and similarly on solar, is quite within the potential of this time frame to do that, and then to have recommendations or considerations of what, what that might look like. And, and you can see how rapidly EV charging is taking on in the city, just compare, just driving around today compared to what you had a year ago. EVs are coming along, and we want to maybe think of maybe pushing that a step or two further, or recognizing the, the benefits to the climate and making a stand on it. So I really am in favor of doing that, is it modifying number four to be more specific as to look, looking for a, a carbon footprint advantage in a rate structure. And I'm going to not limit it to the two examples I just mentioned. There could be, well, more than those. I, uh, um, so I, I'm, I think we, uh, uh, we look at, at um, carbon, foot, uh, carbon, foot, carbon impacts, and, and also uh, there's even a lot of discussion in the industry about externalities. Um, if the uh, UAC decides to make an amendment along those lines, ideally, I, I, it should, I, we would prefer that it's in the form of a, something along the lines of evaluate this, evaluate externa, evaluate the use of externalities in the rate design. One of the things that we're gonna have to be very conscious about is that uh, we have to base our rate design on direct costs. And so we can look at a range of um, greenhouse gas impacts there are some we may, may be able to take into account, and there are others we may not be able to take into account, and that'll be uh, part of a discussion with our attorneys and our rate consultants. May, may I just ask, since we have a, an attorney representative here, whether the city council may, as a policy matter, provide the framework coverage for something that is a little different from pure cost of service? Or, if that is not possible, whether that could, at some point, be put to the voters uh, in the form of a, a ballot measure. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, anything can be put to the voters, and then the question is whether you get the votes. But um, short of that, um, the staff report, uh, and based on the culture service, seems to be the more expeditious, I guess, more practical way to go. But I'll defer to so, Val So can I just talk about timing here? So we've got phase one. Um, and I agree with John that uh, if, if you box us too much, we may find some legal hurdles, and then we can't do anything until we take it all to the vote. So you're going to lose several years there, and we're not, you know, like maybe, you know, now it's 10 years since we last did our cost of service study, or 12 years. So just be mindful of the fact that these, you know, definitely we are, this isn't the end of all cost of service studies ever. Um, we are gonna to try to move pretty quickly as, as we can in getting something in place that updates what we've currently got, and then we're gonna to move to phase two. 
So my sense on that is along with, uh, with what Ms. Abishain is saying is not necessary to make this prescriptive. We don't really have the, the, the whole process as I understand it is the consultant would look at the possibilities, do the analysis and come back to staff and therefore to the commission and city council as what they recommend. So I'm in line with the idea of evaluation with the idea that if it's practical, go forward. Does, does that clear? Can you repeat it? Yes. <laughs> I want to make sure that uh, when we say tw change number four, that it not be seen to be prescriptive. The consultant is going to evaluate to the extent possible and come back to staff and therefore up to the Commission City Council as to what is practical within the time frame you've talked okay, about. Perfect. So I really... Um, like the idea that you're addressing the idea of what the true cost of services for people who have solar or EVs, that I think there's not a lot of general public awareness of what it really costs to have effectively, you know, extra houses put on the system and what they are. And we're, we haven't to date asked people who have put solar on their house to really absorb the cost of what it really costs. And plus they want to have electricity at night and other things. So I'm, I'm very glad that you're considering those. As part of this, are you also going to look at net metering or feed-in tariffs, like what is the way that you're valuing the solar that they're putting onto the system? Yes, absolutely. So one of the, one of the components of this study we have, uh, we may come to, um, we're looking at the possibility that we, we may reach our cap on net energy metering in the next one to three years or so. We're a small utility and three or four large commercial projects could put us over the uh, cap, even though we're not all that close to it right now. Um, so we need to be prepared for what the rules will be for solar and how solar will be compensated. Um, and we'll be looking at that as part of this study. And, and then I have a question um, because I do a lot of work in the low income consumer area. And so I'm just curious, who are our consumer advocates representing low-income consumers in Palo Alto? Do we have them? Um, you know, I sh we don't, I wouldn't say we have a, you know. A, so there's, there's a, not a, like a division of ratepayer advocates or something like that? We have to be conscious of it ourselves and we have to reach out, I think, ourselves as well. I'd say the council is. I mean, frankly, the, the council has all the constituents. Um, so we understand that and we um, put in place programs that we can put in place. Um, to aid low income, and we have a marketing program to make them aware um, that we have these programs. Right, but so so it's self policing rather than there's a formal well, the statutory is, advocate. That's correct. So the okay. the council is the governing body, and so yeah, they're they're ultimately the ones responsible for all of this. I'm I'm not sure I fully understand. No, your no, question. no. If you're well in in so uh, the California PC. There are groups like Turn and the yes. Division of Ratepayer Advocates who and have part of who are interveners and participate in the process. Right, and part of why they need to do that is because there's like a um, uh, there's another element to the investor-owned utilities, right? They're profit, they're profit-driven, and we're not. Uh, th this is we're cost-based. That's all we can recover is cost-based. Mm -hmm. So th there's a, there's a big difference when you look at the investor-owned versus the publicly-owned utilities. So the council, being the governing body and the deciding body, looks out for all of the constituents, and we don't. Um, it, it, it probably uh, ad additional overlays and um, additional. Um, I'm just asking the question yeah, if there's no, an organization so, that represents so, the, like, does AARP ever come and talk to you or something like that? They could. Anybody can. They don't. And again, I would um, just pose okay. to you, the construct is different on purpose. I mean, it, it makes sense that the construct is different here. Uh, Commissioner Schwartz, I think the answer to your question is no. Thank you. Yeah, and furthermore, you're, you know, I mean, I joke to uh, Chair Foster, you're kind of looking at them. You know, we're the, the we should be watching out for that. And, okay, and, that's I, fine. And, and it has come up before in UIC meetings, and, we, and I'm sure in the council. We bring those points. programs to you. We bring the but, uh, but residential. Yet, but, 
but not just programs. Like we have to be vigilant to make sure we're watching out for that. And, well, and, just and we bring those pro the, the the low income programs to you, and you do opine on them, and you do give us direction or tell us to do things differently. I think we have Catherine Elbert, our utilities communications manager, wants to uh, make a few remarks. I just thought I'd add one thing. Thank you, Commissioner Schwartz, for raising this issue because um, it piqued a question in my mind, and it's something that I'd like to look into. But I did want to add. Um, Director Fong has already uh, mentioned the low income um, programs that we do offer. Uh, just for clarification, there are a couple of programs we specifically offer and promote to our um, lower income, maybe income or medically challenged customers, um, residential energy efficiency program and our rate assistance program in which we work with customers to provide them with free efficiency improvement measures in their homes to make sure we are doing what we can to help them keep their bills low and then we offer them a rate assistance program as well. Do we have, so so at other municipal utilities I'm familiar with, they, they have departments that are focused on low income consumers and I realize we're very small so we may not have a department that does that. So it's basically you're saying that it's spread throughout all of us that we have to be the ones to be cognizant. Okay, yes. that's cool, good. Good question. Okay, Council Member Shore. So, as you know, council policy is moving towards electrification. So I think when we think about rates, I think the world has changed a little bit. And I think we need to think about the concepts of energy efficiency versus conservation. Because if you're pushing electrification, you may actually want people to use more electricity, not less, and a three-tiered rate system may be in opposition to that. Um, we obviously want to make sure people are cons not conserved, but are use their energy as efficiently as possible. And I think that's what our rate structure needs to look at in that. So I think we need to think about how we want to do this. I also think in the long term, there's a lot of interesting challenges in that we're carbon neutral. Right? So when, we, when you talked about what is the carbon footprint, I thought that was extremely valuable and extremely useful. Because if we are carbon neutral, that means the more electricity we use, we don't add to the carbon footprint, right? And that's the whole point for electrification. And so I guess I'm asking the question for the UAC to think about is how the council's policy on electrification deals with a tiered rate system that really frankly discourages electrification. And I think that's one of the broader challenges that the UAC should grapple with given council policy. And so I just wanted to raise that in have you guys think no, that, that was behind my initial question, which is while we're in the cost of service territory, it, it doesn't seem practical that we could have a ballot measure before next July. It wouldn't be time to do the analysis and formulate that. But beyond that, we ought to be able to set a policy that's based on um, lowest carbon, for example. And so I think, and I could be wrong, but I would think that that actually lines up more with cost of service frankly. So when you're trying to argue for conservation that, as opposed to efficiency, that tends to actually go against the cost of service studies. Because you know, what you're really saying is we're going to charge people more for using more when it doesn't cost us more to produce the electricity. Not necessarily. Using more for your electric car, maybe lower carbon on a... On a no, that's what I mean. Yeah, but yeah. That's, that's, you're making my exact point. Yeah, yeah, we agree. We agree. So the question comes up is, how we look at that in terms of energy efficiency versus conservation and council's policy towards encouraging, frankly, electrification and how that relates to a three-tiered rate system. And I think that's a, an interesting intellectual conundrum that we need to focus on and figure that out. That's, that's so I have a comment on that, but Commissioner Schwartz, you look like you have something to say. Well, well, I think it's, I mean, I think we're mixing up a lot of things here, though. I, I, I mean, I think that there's the issue that People, electrification of transportation is a wonderful thing if you can shift, you can, sh you can shift things that are basically using gasoline and diesel and things like that onto electricity, which can potentially be produced in a cleaner way. Okay, so, the, the, so it's not, because w when we get electrons at night, we're, we're not getting them from our solar, purchases, we're getting them for wherever, wherever they've been produced. And one of the things that we talked about in the, at the last meeting when we talked about storage was the idea of, you know, that we don't need storage. It was brought up 
by Commissioner Hegelesh because we look at PG&E as our backup supply kind of thing, which is kind of an interesting way to look at it. Um, but I think that you know there's there's a variable cost to deliver electricity at different times of the day onto the system, and whether we're nominally getting ours from a power purchase agreement we're still, the, the, electri the electrons that are flowing into our town cost different amounts of money depending on when they're coming in. And so I think that it's part of a bigger picture. So I think a flat rate um, isn't, isn't necessarily the right way. If we're really trying to reflect true cost of service, right now we can't do anything that is other than have either a flat rate or a tiered structure because we don't have the way to differentiate. For time of service. For time of service, right. right. And time of service, I agree with you, but that's not a tiered structure, that's a time of service structure. No, I, no, I understand that. So, so I think that if we're, so if, we're, if you're trying to say we want to incentivize people to buy an EV and do that, then I think we have to do it in some other way than just do it on the argument of flat versus tiered rates. So I council guess. policy goes beyond EVs and electric, it goes towards electrification of your, of, of your, um, you know, of anything you'd use for gas to move towards electricity. So that would be home heating and having electric as opposed to a gas heater. Um, I think that's the big one people talk about. So it's not just EVs. Right. And I, I think I, as we move in that direction, and also people have the ability to unplug from the grid using, you know, your, your point of a fixed charge for electricity, I think so what we ran into in water rates, right, was that, actually it was garbage rates was the most useful, was that as we moved people towards a mini can from a big can, what we did is we had a smaller and smaller usage, whereas most of the costs are actually fixed. And so when you have mostly fixed costs and you charge on a tiered rate, you tend to, you know, have your rates go up, frankly, for less things. So if we're moving people towards electricity, and I understand your argument, but if we actually believe we have carbon neutral electricity, then we're not creating any new greenhouse gas emissions. So the question becomes, if we're not creating new ga greenhouse gas emissions, and we believe that, then energy efficiency is what's important, not conservation. And I think when you design your rates, I think these are complex issues, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, Greg, can you summarize for us what the city council policy is on electrification? And so can I just, I don't, I don't think the council has had a chance to fully make a decision on that. And in fact, you all will be um, making a recommendation to the council when we bring that to you um, in next month. So I, I think the council, just in all fairness to um, council member Scharf, um, has discussed it, but has n never adopted any policies as yet. There's been a colleague's memo asking us to take a look at this, and that's kind of where we are. Okay, no, I think that that's actually probably more accurate. I think that there's been broad support on the council to move towards an electrification and ask people to do that. And I guess that's what I meant by policy. I think the details are not there at all. And you're, but I think there's been that sort of, I don't know if you disagree, but I actually, I took it as there was council policy on broad detail, on broad outline of we want to move to electrification from gas. Right? So, so am I correct in understanding that you're taking sort of the, Moral is quite, not quite the right word, but the position that if you currently use gas heat and gas cooking, that somehow you should move everything to electricity, that that's somehow morally superior for the environment just on the face of it? That seems to be the general direction. Yeah, yes, because of greenhouse gas reduction, because natural gas is carbon emitting and electricity in Palo Alto is not. So what if one doesn't believe that that's true, that that... I, I mean, well, I don't, that, I, what, that, what, that gas emits that, that, greenhouse gases or that electricity doesn't? Ga I don't think gas is inherently evil. I think it's how it's used efficiently and how it's done. And I, and I don't, I, I mean, so, I, I guess I'm, you know, it's like, it's, I, I'm not prepared to, prepare, to accept but, the basic premise but, that having a gas. Well, a, a healthy debate is really good. I think this is an agenda item for next month, and I think we may be straying a little bit, uh, just a little bit uh, right now off the um, topic, but. Um, 
So let me, let me comment on that and just that we, we get into this Brown Act issue that we're supposed to discuss only the items on the agenda. No, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Val, Val is always there to remind us when we wander astray. Uh, and so I think your point is a valid one to discuss. I, I don't think Director Fong is disagreeing. It's a valid one to discuss. She is gently suggesting we may want to hold off on it until next month. Um, and I guess I, I was going to respond, but I guess we'll, we'll comment for the, you know, we will, we'll, we'll discuss a plenty. Wait, were you going to say? Okay. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, are there any other comments on the COSA? Yeah, I do. So I actually have a, a motion. Are we ready for a motion? So we, we but just to clarify again, I, so the um, staff recommendation, um, s staff request that the Utilities Advisory Commission recommend the council adopt a resolution attachment A, uh, approving the design guidelines for the 2015 electric cost of service analysis attachment B. If you actually look at these attachments, I believe attachment A isn't there and the guidelines are, or I should say the resolution isn't there and the guidelines are attachment A. Um, and so I think what we are recommending is what is attached here as attachment A. Is that correct? That's correct. That's a, yeah. an error in the title. Don't worry about it. The, the resolution itself is kind of non-material. It's the guidelines. So to everyone on the UAC, you should turn to the last page of this memo four we got the very last page, which is an unnumbered page after page 10. And this is specifically, um, do, you, do you have it? So it's, it's the memo that was in our packet. It looks like that. Okay. Mike, you got it. Um, and uh, hang on, I just want to make sure everyone's got it there. Um, right. And it's got these nine guidelines that we discussed. And so this is our opportunity. We can just say we approve them, but this is the opportunity for anybody here. Uh, Commissioner Hall is about to make a motion, but um, if anyone wants to say, and he can make, and let's actually talk about our procedure here. I don't know what his motion is going to be, but let's say for the sake of argument, his motion was were to approve it. Um, at that point, we would have to find out if someone seconds that, which probably someone would. But then anybody here can say, hold on. I'm going to make a substitute motion, which is to change something rather. So just kind of so we understand how this process can work. So you, you get your opportunity to provide input before or after he makes a motion. So just before, Garth, if you don't mind, before you make a motion, does anyone have input they want to provide in terms of changing, recommending a change to anything here or an addition or a deletion or anything like that? Yeah, so my motion involves an addition. Okay. All right, so let's let's go for it. Commissioner Hall, take it away. All right, so an unnumbered, I'd like to look at the attachment A and make a motion that those be adopted with the addition of a new one, which will be an unnumbered one after four, you can pick a number, which would say the, CS, the COSA should evaluate the opportunities for rate designs that reduce global climate footprint and those that increase all, f all fuel energy efficiency. And let me clarify that all, f this is not part of the motion, that all fuel is simply to allow us to make trade-offs between gas and electric. I missed the last part. I have the coastal should evaluate the opportunities for rate designs that reduce the global climate footprint and all fuels that... A and those that increase all fuel energy efficiency, all fuel being hyphenated. Clarify then, that was to examine the opportunity for that within the COSA framework or outside the COSA framework? Within the, within the COSA framework. Any comments or questions? Mm -hmm. And Commissioner Hall, you of course can, if you want to explain anything you can, and if not, anyone can ask any questions. No, I, or I, I think I'm, I'll just quickly say that the first concept is the one that I discussed 
maybe 10 minutes ago, and I really like uh, uh, City Council Member Schaaf's uh, broadening and pointing out to the, the overall purpose of energy efficiency, and I think this is the time to move forward with looking at that. Um, one of the things I'd like to raise is this, this is a very broad and complex topic, and it's going to be a real challenge for us to deal with in phase one in the time frame that we're, uh, that we're trying to achieve. I mean, you're talking about, um, I mean, this, this uh, also leads into the discussion that I, I think Commissioner Danaher um, acknowledged might be in phase two about uh, things that might have to go on the ballot, for example. Um, and I think you had, you had talked about that in your, in your discussion as well. So if there's, any, if there's a way to include this as something to, that we ensure we consider in phase two, that would be helpful to us. Um, or narrow it. It's just so broad. It would um, be a little problematic for us to try okay. to get this all done. And, well, well, and probably we're going to come back and you say, no, you didn't consider every single little thing that you should have considered. And So there are two parts to it. Let me just ask staff the question. Uh, so there are two parts that I cobbled together. The first one had to do with uh, designs that reduce global climate footprint. And my presumption when we discussed earlier is that that is not so difficult within the time frame, but that uh, it may require a, a, a city council policy statement or decision that provides coverage for that. If that is legally not sufficient, then it would have to be put to the voters. But I think that the former action may be okay. The city council maybe could provide the coverage for it in a policy decision. That the and city council would provide a policy that um, uh, allow, allowed us to do things we would not otherwise be able to do under the California Constitution. Under 26, it would allow us to move forward with electric designs that encourage uh, encourage right. a, a movement so towards reducing global carbon footprint. Can I just say, sorry, John, but you can correct me when I'm wrong. Can I just say that in the past when we have, I'm getting a back feed here, but nobody else is just oh. you and me. So anyway, um, when, when we have asked, uh, gone to city council and they have um, deviated from, a, you know, an absolute cost of service, it's been um, a specific number and for a very specific reason. It hasn't just been a broad, go figure out everything that you could do that's good for the environment and figure out what it would cost and we're going to give you authority to do all that because they can't. So whenever we've sought something, and I'll give you a very specific example, the, the feed and tariff, Palo Alto Clean, we gave them a specific number and specific reasons for why it made sense to go above what otherwise was the identified avoided cost. Um, the debate occurred at the council, and ultimately the council um, made a decision on it. Um, so I, I'll just say to you, it's, it's not clear to us when you just give us a broad, go for it, go figure this all out. Um, and get the council to agree to some policy statement around this. It's, it's not implementable in some regards. Um, and I don't know that the, well, I would ask um, um, senior city attorney Grant Calling to let us know, can, can the council uh, do that comfortably without creating some legal risk for the city? I mean, this is, sorry, this is one of the things about the phase two part of this work plan is that it doesn't all have, not everything has to be dealt with all at once. So if this, if this is a topic, um, you know, working through this topic with the attorneys and, and this is, work with the attorneys and other departments um, is something that we can do earlier, um, that may be one way to go at this rather than uh, recommending strongly that we deal with it before July 1st, 2016, or as part of the rate designs that have to be completed by the end of December. So I'm, gonna, to I'm, just, I'm just gonna push back on you because I think there's a simple part. I, I do believe the oil fuel is, is a, maybe a longer term challenge. It, it, it takes a lot, it, it takes uh, trade-offs between gas usage and electric usage and a and, and number of considerations around that. But I do think on the, elect on the global footprint, it's a lot simpler to take a step on that in that direction than we're admitting to. And you've just focused on the two particular elements and they could be spelled out in, in the motion if needs be. 
uh, using an encouragement to electric vehicles and increased pricing for solar would be potentially two elements of that. This is only an evaluation. The evaluate, this is not prescribing that the, that, that the consultant would come up and find those to be viable. The consultant may come up and say, not yet, but it's, a, it's an evaluation. I also believe that if they find it is viable, but for a city council policy change to allow it to happen, that can happen in a heartbeat if the city council wants to do it. I, I think, and I'm, I'm I like to accommodate, you know, I like, yeah, I think, I think, the, I think the challenge, I think the challenge here is that you want us to do that evaluation thoroughly, because this is something that where you're, um, th this is, this is going to be a place where you're, where you're tiptoeing and you want to work very carefully to make sure that you're uh, balancing the Prop 26 considerations and, um, and really examining all options. And if we don't have time to do a thorough analysis of something like this, I think you run the risk of uh, us coming back and, and saying that we can't um, when we haven't had a chance to. So then the, the consultant comes back and says there's insufficient basis for proceeding at this point. If staff agrees and, and commission, the commission agrees and, and the city council agrees, then it moves to phase two. But if it's not the case, they say it's a simple step you can take, okay. and it, all it requires is pol a council policy implementation and can be done, then I, I would say it's viable. I just think, go for it. So it, would, it, would it be along the lines of in phase one, uh, look to see if there is a quick, a quick answer and way to solve this problem, and if and then and then an initial expand it out an, to phase two if we if if it requires more analysis then we can accommodate in that. An initial time step. Frame. In the next 20 years, or as long as we all live, there will be increments towards managing global climate change. There will never be the final step, and so this is a first step. And we just picked two examples that they can focus on to make it happen. Phase two can take further steps. So I can modify my, um, my motion by withdrawing it and adding a part C to the current four, that a C would be evaluate the opportunities for rate designs that reduce global climate footprint, period. How, and the context of that is already on in electric vehicles and electric heating customers. So that's already stated in the first part of four. <coughs> I would also like to add to the first part of part four, instead of, instead of just electric vehicles and electric heating customers say, electric vehicles, comma, electric heating customers, comma, and solar power generation and excuse me, and local solar power generation. Uh, I, and is there, is there a way that that, the, the, is there something in there that you're, you're adding that um, isn't accommodated in number seven or isn't uh, dealt with in, in, in guideline seven? Number seven is passive and it's evaluating the impact. It's not evaluating rate designs that would promote and be focused on a global climate footprint. I, I, I should be really clear with number four, I mean, it, and I just have to say this for the, because of the Prop 26 issues, we're not, it, number four, to, our intention with number four is not to evaluate rate designs that promote Okay. These uses. All right. So then I'm going to I'm going to withdraw that latter one and go back to my original one. Well, and, would you Would you please restate C that you just proposed? Yes. Actually, I'm going to withdraw it, and if you don't mind, because it it I, the, the staff has just pointed out that they're not looking. Number four does not address something that promotes. So I'm going to restate it for an unnumbered mo, an unnumbered guideline that says. The COSA should evaluate the opportunities for rate designs that reduce global climate footprint, period. Evaluate the opportunities. Under the COSA framework, outside the COSA framework, or both? Within. 
Okay, so let's talk about a procedural point. So, and again, this is mostly for Mike and Judith. So at this point, uh, uh, Garth has made a motion, and each of us has a choice to do one of two things. We can second the motion, or we can do nothing. If someone seconds the motion, then any of us, including the person who seconded the motion, can make a substitute amendment that says something else. If nobody does that, we then vote on uh, Garth's motion, and if it gets a majority approval, we're done. If it doesn't, then we keep on working until we come up with a motion. So I will second Garth's motion. So what this means now, I've seconded it, and anybody else here, including me, can, can make a substitute motion. So if anyone would like to do that, they can, and if not, we're gonna vote on it. So I would like to make the substitute motion that they, that they do what you're saying, but in phase two, because I think it is really more complicated than that, and I think that if there's anything I've seen about this utility is they're very sensitive to these issues. I don't get the feeling they're gonna run out and say, okay, we can go buy coal, and you know that'll get the price down. So I'm, I, I don't feel concerned about that. I think they've demonstrated a huge concern, and I think it is, to, to do the correlation between rate design and, and carbon impact is non-trivial, in my opinion, from what I've seen in the, what I, with what I do, it, I, I just, it just seems really much more complicated, so I would support them to okay. do it. So can we have uh, the motion, but for so, phase two. Okay, so we need to think about um, technically exactly how we accomplish what you're trying to do, and there's, I think, two ways to do it. One possibility is that you're saying your substitute motion is simply to approve the staff recommendation as is. And then by the way, we'll address this point that, you know, when we do phase two. And then that's one way you mm -hmm. could be doing it. And the second way you could be doing it is my, my substitute motion, your substitute motion is to approve the staff recommendation as is with an additional formal comment in there that when we come back to phase two, we're gonna stick this in. Do you have a preference between it's kind of, do you want to be formal or informal on that? We'll come back to it in phase two. Well, well in the interest of compromise, <laughs> I would say let's put it in that we do it so it's in, more formal. So that it's a study point in phase okay. two. Okay. So, Director Fong. I second that. Okay. Wow. That was, that was quick. Okay. So now we have a substitute motion and a second. So what we would do at this point is vote on that unless... There's a substitute motion <laughs> to that. <laughs> Mike, this is your big opportunity. <laughs> so, I just hate to jump in, but yeah. one of the things I think that there's substitute motions and there's amendments. Okay. And what she made was a substitute motion, but you can also amend motions. Oh, that's a good point. And okay. It's different feel to it, right? Yes, like, yes. I like your motion, but I want to tweak it this way. That's interesting. Because so around here, we actually don't tend to don't do, do that. We only do substitute, but that's a good point. Um, Appreciate it. Anyway, that's just, fine. <laughs> Okay. We're all learning. All right. So I'm not hearing any substitute motions to the substitute motion. So with that, we will vote on Judith's substitute motion. All in favor? Uh, oh, wait. Hold on. Do you have a question, any Mike? Further discussion. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Any further discussion? Uh, I just wanted Judith to repeat it. <laughs> oh, now that's an unfair test. I, I can't repeat um, that, I guess, okay, that that in looking at the, uh, in a, in, I vote, I move that we accept the staff recommendation as is, and that we add a line that says that we would like them to consider the impact of, uh, the carbon impact of the rate design when they do the study, the phase two study. Yeah, and let me just add, for everyone's sake, also another avenue for the UAC to um, forward either individual or group opinions is to head over to the Finance Committee when they take up this matter uh, and or go to the City Council when it takes up this matter. And bring so that. if you do that, you are speaking, and if you are n not representing the, um, the vote of the Commission, you're speaking as an individual when you do that. Correct, which is fine. Yeah. 
Okay, Garth, you for the comment? So I'm going to vote against it, but I just want to make clear, I don't think it's a bad idea. To, the, the whole concept is, is, is in the right direction. I just, um, when I vote against it, I, it's simply because I think I want to stay with it getting done in phase one as far as possible. Um, John and Val, as, as phrased by uh, Commissioner Hall, is, is that uh, burdensome? Is, you know, unduly burdensome? That they so we always envisioned it would be part of phase two. We don't have time to embed it in phase one if we're going to stay on the current time frame, but we can certainly accelerate pieces of phase two, as John was saying, and we can make that one of the earlier pieces of phase two. That would be very positive, I believe. Yeah. Um, by the way, and just to clarify, so we're about to <laughs> vote on Judas substitute motion. If hers fails, if folks vote, I mean, basically, if folks prefer Gars, then they'd vote against Judas, because then we would immediately after vote on Gars. If people approve Judas, we'll never get back to Gars, just so we all know what we're doing here. Okay, any other commentary? Okay, all in favor of Judas' motion say aye. Aye. Okay, all opposed? And I'm opposed. You're opposed? Well, isn't that interesting? I, I, I'll, I'll, vote, I'll vote aye on this. So you're going to vote in favor of I'll Judas vote in motion. favor of the substitute motion. I appreciate okay. Val's comment that you can accelerate okay. some of the study. Um, the record will reflect that I abstained on this one. It passed by a three to one vote. Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and then back to my original comment, all of this is analysis under the COSA framework. At some point, it'd be good to have a discussion or an analysis of what could, might be done if we were outside the COSA framework. Okay. Well, that was interesting. And now we will move on to our next agenda item, uh, which interestingly enough is, uh, let's see now, selection of potential topics for discussion at a future UAC meeting. Um, and is, are we doing that one now because we're about to hit water? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, is there any, I mean, we have already discussed some of the topics for a future UAC meeting. Does anyone have anything they want to add? Uh, and Mike and Judith, this is an opportunity. If there are things that you think we should be talking about that don't seem to be on the agenda, we can mention them now. Um, I forgot about our uh, water issue with uh, Garth, so if you don't mind, uh, Director Fong and everyone else, I'm going to accelerate some commissioner comments, okay? Um, a couple of commissioner comments. One is... So gonna, there's nothing with item five's done? Item five is done. Okay. That's yep. right. I'm just keeping track. Okay, a few things. I'm going to start with a housekeeping item. Um, as, uh, as, as Judith learned recently, uh, the email address uac at cityofpaloalto.org goes to all uh, utility uh, advisory commissioners, so just FYI. Um, when I joined the UAC a number of years ago, um, I prefer to keep email addresses separate and not use my work or personal email. And so I inquired about uh, using a city email address as city council members do, and I was told that wasn't possible. Um, I can't quite imagine or remember why that was. Um, so I went out and got my own email address. It is jfoster at paloaltouac.org. It was available. It is not a city address. It is what it is. So I would say two things. If there are any new commissioners or existing commissioners, um, who would like to use a Palo Alto UAC.org address, meaning mine, I can do that. Um, I would also say it might be worth, it's now six years since I joined uh, the UAC, might be worth, I'll, 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 I guess I'll look at Grant on this one. I, I think it was, some, I don't know, I don't know what the reason for it was. It might be worth just kind of checking again to see if there's any particular reason or, or Val or someone to just see if we can have city addresses for anyone who might want to. That is my first point. Second point. Um, um, what? Okay. Um, second point. Uh, I'm going to, uh, just for uh, my colleagues and for everybody uh, listening along here, point out the utilities quarterly update that we all received. We receive these, as you might expect, once a quarter. 
Um, they are not agendized. We, in general, don't discuss them, but in the commissioner comment section, you certainly can. They are chock full of interesting and useful information. I encourage you to look through it and, frankly, to highlight items that you think are worth noting because everyone looks at them, but you may kind of see something uh, that others might not. And believe it or not, I have a whole bunch of things to talk about in this particular one, but I'll try and be fairly quick. Starting on page 15, um, there is a whole page, or almost an entire page here, on FTTP and wireless plan timetable and the Citizen Advisory Commission, a committee, I should say, and so on and so forth. So Judith and Mike in particular, you guys should take a look at this. And um, it does in particular mention uh, CTC Technology and Energy, which is a consulting firm working with the city on this. They made a presentation to the Citizens Advisory Committee, um, and that you should just hear what that was all about and possibly. I think that was included in materials provided by okay. uh, staff. Good. Okay, that's page 15. Page 16, Palo Alto Green Gas. The Palo Alto Green Gas is an opt-in program, and is, um, meaning you have to sign up for it. And the report here indicates uh, you know, that something on the order of about 5% of people have signed up so far. In comparison, Palo Alto uh, Green, the electric program, uh, eventually got to about 20%. Um, I received input from a member of the public uh, requesting that we switch this program from an opt-in program to an opt-out program. In other words, everyone would be signed up, uh, unless, of course, they opted out. Uh, this member of the public who's been very actively engaged in this issue uh, provided information, not surprisingly, that opt-out programs tend to have 97% participation or whatever, very few people opt out. Um, and so uh, this was discussed with city staff when it was put in. Uh, there was a feeling that opt-in was the better way to go, um, but it is something that we may want to reconsider at some point, and I believe city staff may have considered whether this should ever become a neither opt-in nor opt-out, but sort of a program adopted for all customers. Director Fong, am I correct about that? Has that been sort of in the thinking somewhere? Can I just say this? What we asked for was time to get our feet on the ground and make this program work. Um, as, as you know, Palo Alto Green Electric was um, always an opt-in program. It's not the default program, but we learned how to do it. We learned how to do it right. um, within a cost cap that the council identified, and we have been able to maintain that. So just something to think about for the future. On page 18 in the second paragraph, Director Fong, um, you mentioned uh, that uh, the utilities department is implementing a customer engagement web application uh, to help customers reduce energy consumption through behavioral modifications, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let me see now. Staff will work to leverage the web application to launch a community challenge, which is a citywide contest to meet a 10% energy reduction goal. It sounds very exciting. I'm just curious to know when is this going to be launched, to the best of your knowledge? Uh, I don't know. What? Um, I'm, I don't actually know the exact title, but it okay. is re related Later to this the Georgetown year? Utility Energy Prize uh, competition. And Ms. Elver, would we expect press announcements and so on and so forth, or Director Fong, or whoever wants to respond to that? Of course. Wonderful. Yes, of course, UAC, we will keep you updated on all new program rollouts, and I believe that we do anticipate the rollout of the program you were asking about uh, around the time frame of September. Uh, that could be a moving target, so don't quote me on that, but that's we, what we won't hold you to for. it. Fabulous. On page 20, um, there's a uh, summary of the program for emerging technologies. And again, Judith and Mike, this is a program the utilities department has had in place for several years now that encourages early stage companies, or it doesn't have to be an early stage company, but a company with a new emerging technology that they'd like to field test in Palo Alto to submit an application. We obviously do not accept everyone who comes. In fact, we don't accept most. And the statistics here indicate that according to this. Um, from the program's inception in June 2012, uh, 37 applications have been received. Um, and Director Fong, if you could help me out here, 37 have been received, two are under review, 25 have been declined, six are active, and four are completed. Does that mean we have accepted six and are field testing with six? Yes. And four completed means what? Does that mean we are going to but haven't started yet? Or, or, or we did so and we're done? We're done. Okay, meaning of the 37 will plot. I'm uncomfortable with this because, again, this, you, you should probably be doing this offline with me because it's 
Not an agendized item. Oh, it's commissioner comment. I'm just asking some questions. I, I'll turn to the city attorney, and if the city attorney's comfortable, I'm comfortable. Yeah. Good. Um, and then the next one, and this is, I think, also in the category of comments, on page 21, I'd point out the statistics on electric vehicles in Palo Alto um, indicates that we now have 980 uh, known electric vehicle owners, um, or electric vehicles, I believe. Uh, actually, let me back up, 1,100 electric vehicles uh, in Palo Alto. Um, given there are only 65,000 residents of Palo Alto, and at least some of them presumably don't drive, um, that's actually a very impressive statistic about electric vehicle adoption. Judith? Question about this. So, so I'm comfortable uh, with the comments. I'm less comfortable with the questions is my point. Okay. That's all. I mean, you can ask it, uh, but, uh, you know. Go, go ahead, Judith. The city attorney doesn't seem to be uh, concerned. Judith, fire away. If, don't worry. No one will. Well, I guess, I guess what my question is, is uh, it seems to me that there are lots of things that in a community like Palo Alto, people are anxious to do because they think it's the right thing to do. And I don't understand that why we would give a rebate for anything to people buying Teslas. Like if they want to do- I don't do, think we do. What, what, well, I don't know, it says do we? rebate. You know, 70. It's the state of California. Oh. Okay, so so the rebate checks that they claim totaling 2.2 million, 2.3 million came from the state of California, not from. Correct. Yeah, yeah. You paid okay. for it as a taxpayer, not as a. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> but it, but it just seems to me Electric that customer. that so that that uh, like when we when I was looking for the gray water thing, we could only find something about rebates. And I just said, I, wanted, I want to do this as a citizen. I'm not going to do it or not do it because of a rebate. I just want the information of how to do it. And I think that that's one of the things that just sort of cons philosophically, I think that it would be helpful if we can offer information that doesn't have to be tied to a rebate. So that, I guess that's, maybe that's a comment then and not a question. Um, and my last comment is on uh, page 28, last paragraph on the gas utility overview. I think there's an interesting statistic here um, that gas sales um, between January and April um, were the lowest seen in over a decade. And just an interesting statistic worth noting. That's it for me on Commissioner comments. Um, Commissioner Hall, are you leaving us at this point? Mm -hmm. I am indeed. Uh, I just want to say for the sake of the new commissioners that as much as I respect and um, enjoy Ms. Daly's presentations and Ms. Elvis' information, I have a, I have a conflict of interest in a position. Uh, my day job is at Santa Clara Valley Water District, and I believe that for most of water, water issues, it presents a conflict of interest for me, so I excuse myself from these meetings at this point. And thank you. Garth, see you next month. Greg, good to see you. Thanks for your time and contribution. Okay. On that note, we are now moving on to now, uh, uh, Director Fong, did you say we're moving seven in front of six? Okay. So update and discussion on impacts of statewide drought on water and hydroelectric supplies. Good evening. Carla Daly, Senior Resource Planner. I will be very quick because I know you have a lot of, another big item after this. Um, just a quick review of where we are from a regulation standpoint. April 1st was governor's executive order. April 15th, the SFPUC, our water supplier, confirmed their continued request for a 10% voluntary reduction. On May 6th, the State Water Resources Control Board mandated that Palo Alto reduce potable water use by 24%. Um, another number that's hanging out there is the Santa Clara Valley Water District asking its customers to reduce 30%. And on May 11th, uh, Palo Alto City Council adopted water use restrictions via resolution that are listed on the next, well, they're listed in a couple of slides, but uh, I'm not gonna go over all of these regulations tonight. I just wanted to, you to have them in front of you in one um, easy to read, hopefully comprehensive list. But as far as the state regulations go, the big one is number one, that Palo Alto must reduce potable water use by 24% for the period June 1st, 2015 through February 28th, 2016, compared to a base year of 2013. And so uh, this slide four is just a continuation of the list of regulations uh, adopted by the state. And then 
slide five shows you additional regulate restrictions that were adopted by the Palo Alto City Council um, with the end goal of getting to that 24% number mandated by the state. Uh, the biggest one here um, is one that you're all already aware of. It's the limit on outdoor irrigation to two days a week, and we have a schedule for that. Properties with auto no addresses on Mondays and Thursdays, even addresses on Tuesdays and Fridays, and this is being implemented indeed across not only Santa Clara County, but throughout San Mateo County and um, most of the East Bay as well. So um, you should be seeing that message not only here in Palo Alto, but pretty much anywhere you go in the Bay Area. And I will um, also mention that we do have a process for alternative irrigation plans. Uh, our community service department has submitted one for, our parks and rec department, sorry, has submitted one for uh, irrigating the parks and uh, the Palo Alto um, Hills Golf and Country Club has submitted one for irrigating that area as well. Both of those have been approved by the city manager at that time. So those customers will have the ability to water more than two days a week, but will um, reduce their overall outdoor water use by 34%, so 10% more than what we as the city need to reduce overall. And the reason why it's higher is because we know that we need to get more reduction from outdoor use than indoor use in order to get to the overall reduction of 24%. Um, so we're working on signage for the parks to uh, helping the parks and recs department with signage to tell people why some areas are gonna be not looking so good um, in, in order to keep the, the high benefit use playing fields green and safe and usable for our community. Um, Slide six is just a quick review of how we're dealing with enforcement. Uh, this slide is a view as of April 30th of the uh, precipitation at Hetch Hetchy where we get our drinking water. It does not include the couple of storms that we had in May, which were not completely insignificant. So that red line, which is um, in the year 2015, is probably ticked up about to where we were in 2014. So it, we did get a little bit of precip in, um, in May, which helped a tiny bit, but still leaves us very dry, of course. And then slide eight is an overview of all of the SFPUC uh, regional system and a sort of fictitious dotted line of where we all need to be as a region to all meet our individual state mandated uh, reductions. So um, the SFPUC kind of took all the agency's use and all those different sta state mandated reductions and came up with a, a theoretical curve of where we would need to be. And as you can see, we're doing really well as a region. Um, in Palo Alto, and this, uh, this data is as of May 27th, I believe, we are down 17.6% compared to 2013. So doing pretty well, but still have a ways to go to get to that 24%. So uh, we're coming up on the really important months of when the weather tends to get hotter and people tend to irrigate more. And that's when we really, really, really need to see the reductions. Uh, to date, here's what's happened. We haven't, uh, we haven't levied any fines. We haven't uh, even got to a, um, a third notice and certainly haven't put any flow restrictors on anyone. And then this is just a quick view, and we're, we're at the end of the year, so I, this should be the last time you see this table with respect to fiscal year 2015. Um, but even though, oh, well, there's not much left. To, this number's not gonna change much um, from now till the end of the fiscal year. Um, so the, Lack of water did cost the electric utility more, but not enough more to uh, impact the, the um, cap on purchasing RECs to keep the portfolio carbon neutral. That's it. You up? Questions? Who set the rules on notices and fines? Is that a utility department or is it city council? Council. 
Education list of vendors in the uh, weekly. <laughs> okay, this is an excellent presentation. I really appreciate it. It's, it's good to see where we stand, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, item six um, staff recommendation that the UAC recommend that the City Council adopt two resolutions uh, basically on amending rate schedules and activate, uh, activating drought surcharges. Um. <clears throat> um, I, so I have a presentation here. It's, it's several slides. Um, it, it actually goes on for a while because this is a pretty complex topic, but I wanted, I wanted to just ask before I launch into it whether um, the staff report provided enough clarity that we could just launch into questions. Um, I, I, if there are specific parts of the presentation you'd like me to go over, I can do that, but I, I would So ask here's what I'd say. Um, I read it, um, and I had the opportunity to talk with um, Val and Jane on this on Monday. Um, and this is slightly complicated. Um, uh, so, uh, I'm fine with it, but I think we should maybe do at least a 60-second overview okay. of what exactly is being proposed. And let me, let, let's actually just um, uh, run through the request. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just present slide two here. Okay. So right. we're, we're recommending adoption of two resolutions here. One, uh, um, amending, a water, amending the water rates um, to raise rates 4% and add drought surcharges. So this is going to. This is the resolution that will change the rate schedules effective September first, twenty fifteen. So both of these things would occur on September first. Right, and then the second resolution would activate the drought, the twenty percent level, the, the drought surcharges for the twenty percent reduction level. Okay, so the drought surcharges that we're recommending adoption, we're recommending adoption of a whole suite of drought surcharges for different scenarios. We're recommending a second resolution that uh, activates one of those scenarios on September 1st as right. well. And, and, and so let's discuss this, and again, just so we're all on the same wavelength. Once upon a time, the UAC, you requested, the uh, utility department staff requested a 12% rate increase. We approved that recommendation, and this increase, or that increase. Well, we requested that increase to be effective July 1. Correct, right. Um, and we said, good. And then now this increase is being broken into two parts, 8% effective July 1 and 4% effective September 1 for whatever reason. Um, and so, so the 8% is not on the table. What is on the table is the 4% effective September 1 plus a drought surcharge effective September 1. Uh, yes? Plus, yes. plus adding a set of drought surcharges to the rate schedules, plus activating one of those. So maybe scenarios. we should think of it a different way. We are adding drought surcharges to the rate schedule. Then we are raising rates, not having anything to do, to do with the drought four, per, or at least those those schedules. Though that we've just four percent on September one, and then adding drought surcharges off of that schedule, effective September one. Is that a good way to think of it? Uh, you're the, the, probably saying exactly what I'm what I'm trying but, to but say. Maybe I, I, believe, I believe you are saying the, the same thing. Yeah, I think okay. we're probably saying the All same right. thing. I, I, fine. It sounds like everyone knows what I'm saying if I'm not saying it that articulately. Okay. I, um, if it's helpful, I can also go through slide three, which no, is the I, background. I, sure. I, th I thought the I memo was excellent. I, I have no yeah. questions. Sure. Go ahead for slide three. Yeah. Okay. So let me just go through uh, three and four, really, the background. And I think this is actually really important to review. Okay. So. Um, Going all the way back, especially for the new commissioners, um, since this extends before they were on the commission, uh, back last fall, um, as the drought was stretching, it was as we were getting into the drought, um, we came to the UAC and the Finance Committee and Council and said, we want to set up some drought surcharges, get them on our rate schedule so that we can have them ready in case we need them. Uh, so we went and we had design guidelines approved, just like we had uh, just just uh, recommended for approval, um, just like you recommended for approval, the electric rate design guidelines. Um, 
those were those were approved by the council. Uh, we got started on the cost of service analysis. Uh, meanwhile, we we're doing our financial forecasting in the spring, and uh, we were getting our wholesale supply cost projections from the SFPUC. Um, they raised, they projected a raising that they were going to raise their uh, supply rate 30 percent. Um, and that resulted in us recommending a 12% rate increase to the UAC and Finance Committee um, to cover those costs. Uh, so we proceeded with our usual uh, procedures under proposition under the California Constitution. Uh, we mailed out the Prop 218 notice that contained that 12% rate increase using our existing um, water. Uh, water rate design methodology based on our 2012 cost service analysis. Um, right around the same time we send out the Prop 218 notices, there was a court decision uh, that provided some additional guidance on rate design, um, particularly around tiered rates. Uh, since we already, we were still in the middle of the drought cost service study at that point, since we had Raftelis financial consultants on and they had established our 2012 cost of service methodology, we said, okay, well, why don't we expand that contract slightly and have them take a look at the uh, methodology and just validate it. So they found that the uh, city's water rate methodology was sound overall. They, rec but they also recommended some adjustments to the way peaking capacity costs were allocated among the customer classes and the tiers. Um, we wanted to include those adjustments. So the adjustments um, involved, so we, uh, the adjustments involved a slight increase to the tier one residential rate and a slight decrease to the tier two. Okay, so the Prop 218 notice we sent out had a 12% increase with this residential tier one rate, this residential tier two rate. We wanted to, um, uh, if we had incorporated the adjustments and gone, gone forward with 12% increase, we would have ended up with this sort of, uh, uh, these sort of rates. And in that case, the tier one rate would have been above what we send out in the Prop 218 notice, which we can't do. We can adopt something that's lower than what's in the Prop 218 notice, but not above. So what we're recommending to the council next Monday is we're going to go just go with an 8% increase. That brings both tiers down. The tier one is now matching the Prop 218 notice, and we can move forward. Uh, but to complete the whole 12%, that we recommend to the UAC and Finance Committee. Uh, we now have to go ahead with a 4% increase, an additional 4% increase effective September 1st. That's the earliest that we could get back um, given all the noticing requirements. We don't like sending out multiple Prop 218 notices, but we knew that we would have to do it anyway because of the drought surcharges. So this was a convenient way to combine those things. Um, it's not our ideal process, but it's the, uh, it's the one that we were able to to pull together given the situation. May I move that we approve? Nope, can't do so yet because we have a public comment. Oh. Um, Herb Borak. Okay. But otherwise you could, Mike. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I would urge you to uh, uh, not uh, recommend uh, approval uh, of this proposal to the council. In fact, I would go further and also ask you to uh, recommend that the council not approve what is on its agenda for the uh, previous proposed rate increase. And that finally, that you recommend that the council direct staff to go back to processing these proposed rate increases the way they were uh, from the time uh, Proposition 218 uh, became effective on July 1st, 1997, until recently, when it was the city council, rather than the city staff, that determined what proposed rate increases were sent out to the ratepayers to find out whether they approved those rate increases. It's only recently where city staff has sent out the Proposition 218 notices without going to the council to have the council make a decision that it is appropriate to do that. Uh, 
this is important with uh, these rate increases compared to other fees and charges under Proposition 218. Under Proposition 218, other fees and charges require either a vote of the property uh, <coughs> uh, owners or the uh, two-thirds vote of the electorate. Uh, gas and electricity are exempt uh, from the definition of these fees and charges under the proposition. And it's only water, uh, sewer, and refuse that come under this procedure where uh, property, uh, where ratepayers would have to send in a written objection. Uh, and the way it's implemented in Palo Alto is, you know, to put down their service address and their account number. Uh, just last week, uh, there was a letter to the editor from Palo Alto resident Barb Adler, who is the retired controller of San Mateo County, and I believe he accurately described this process as an arbitrary and impossible threshold to stop the increases was established. So by staff sending out these notices before the city council has had a chance to say whether that's appropriate to do, the city council is placed in the position where uh, this onerous process has occurred and it's most likely that uh, there's not going to be the objection to whatever staff sent out and city council is removed from the process in that sense. This is asked essentially a fait accompli to go approve what staff is proposing. Uh, further, since you have two possible increases that we're talking about, you might as well do it all over from the beginning <clears throat> and have the 12% done at one time and this time do it the right way, which is when the Utilities Advisory Commission and the Finance Committee make a recommendation, staff doesn't then send out the notices. Instead, it goes to the council and the council decides what should be sent out in the notice. That's the way it used to be done and it's only recently that the process has been done this way. And so for those reasons, uh, I, I believe that the uh, commission should reject this proposal and I think the council should reject what's on its agenda. Now I realize uh, staff has, what has been doing has been tolerated recently by the council. But just as you've seen on other issues before the council recently, uh, that's not happening on certain things anymore. That's why we have elections. And I believe this is another one of those issues where things have to be restored to the way they were before. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bork, um, let me just ask a question, and just for our colleagues, we're not supposed to engage in sort of discussion, but we right. can ask a clarifying <laughs> question. Um, and so if I understand you correctly, you are not raising an objection to the substantive rate increase, you're objecting to the process, is that correct? Well, I, I did, I mean, I didn't have a light here to know whether he's using my time. I did have w one question on the substance uh, as well. Uh, and certainly if it comes to the point of taking care of the process as I suggest, and that has to do with uh, recycled water, which is in the recent court decision said it doesn't matter whether it's recycled water or, or drinking water, it's still a water service. And because it's recy recycling water would essentially free up uh, drinking water for others. And that was in a case where there was an, a capital expense for the recycled water and who should which ratepayers should pay for it. Palo Alto has an unusual situation where currently the recycled water is given away for free, including to two companies that then sell it to customers outside of Palo Alto. But what happens is, is those customers in Palo Alto, which happens to be the city of Palo Alto, irrigation for parks and the golf course, then don't get to pay their share of all these water fixed expenses that everybody else is doing. So, uh, it would be something that would be novel under the case law because it's just the opposite factual situation in terms of, of the expense. Uh, but it would seem to me, in terms of substance, that's something that could be handled if this, because of the procedural question, if the council agrees and the commission agrees, that we can then have an opportunity to discuss that, that question on recycled, which was, we could not do because these notices were sent out just around the time that that court decision was made uh, on April 20. Got it. Thank you. So colleagues, um, uh, in general, I think the UAC is not in a good position to weigh in or opine on pr legal procedural issues. 
I think we turn to the city council. So if I could just say, yeah. we have worked very closely with the city attorney's office. The process we follow is, I mean, anyone who doesn't live in Palo Alto also gets these notices in the same, um, um, during, using the same processes we use here. At home, I'm an East Bay Mud customer, and indeed, before the East Bay Mud Board takes action, I'm, I've gotten the notice, because how does the board know what kind of protests I'm going to raise? Um, I would venture to guess John in the SFPUC's service territory similarly um, gets his Prop 218 notice. Actually, I don't know if he does. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't. So uh, anyway, it's just a juris it's, every jurisdiction does it like this. Just And that's so because it's... Uh, the city attorney, we all work with our attorneys. Right. So Grant, is it, would it be fair of me to assume that if the UAC recommended to the city council that they adopt uh, the staff recommendation, but the city attorney's office felt that the procedure here was not the right one, that the city attorney's office would then advise the city council and the city council would then. I, ha I have to, I, I just have to say, we wouldn't have. We, I we, understand, Val. Okay, I, I mean, just the implication just, that we would do something that the city attorney is saying I, is not I, legally correct is. I understand, um, Val. I get it. Pales right. beyond anything I can think we would okay. ever do. So, to Chair, do yeah, I, Chair hang, Foster. Hang on. So, hang, yes, hang on. Uh, the, oh, wait. the, the not, public comment now was. Excuse me. Sure. Can I finish my question? Okay. So, my question was, in the event that we recommended to the city council what the staff would like us to recommend, and the city attorney's office did not agree with it, I realize this is a hypothetical, I realize this would never occur, because I have no doubt the staff would have checked with the city attorney's office. Having said that, if that did occur, and the city attorney's office felt the process being followed was not the correct one, should I assume the city attorney's office would inform the city council of that fact? Chair Foster, yeah, Grant Carling, senior assistant city attorney, I would certainly recommend that to Molly Stump, the city attorney. Uh, the comment notwithstanding from the public, uh, I think it's safe to assume that, and, I, and again, I have not been a utilities attorney for probably eight years now, but I know that our office has been counseling staff on these matters for quite some time. And I would have to assume that uh, what staff has done is consistent with our legal advice. So yes, okay. if, yes. In fact, there wasn't an issue. I would certainly Got present it. that to Molly to to deal with that at the council. Yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so what I would say, folks, and this is just my opinion, and anyone else can weigh in on this. I would take the position that again, we are not, as in the UAC, in a good position to weigh in on the uh, legal process here. Um, and given that, I would make a motion to uh, approve the staff recommendation. Now, before anyone seconds, any, well, try to remember, actually, someone would have to second this and then people can comment. Does anyone want a second? Okay, Judith seconds. Is there any comment before we vote? And uh, of course, there can always be substitute motions as well. Mike? Well, thank you for the explanation. That was helpful. That's it? Okay. Anything else? Any comments, James? Okay. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Nay. It carries unanimously. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, I uh, accelerated several commissioner comments on my side. Does anyone else? We'll, we'll, we'll come back to commissioner comments. Any commissioner comments from anybody? Okay. Um, Val, the next scheduled meeting, uh, are we sticking with this July 1 date? Very good. Yes, we are. All right. Thanks, everyone. This meeting is adjourned. Have a good night.